Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the City of Bothell Council meeting for September 16th. If you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great. Thank you, everybody. As I look on the news of this week, being able to stand up and say the Pledge of Allegiance and Freedom as we look around the world and see the chaos going on along. It's a pleasure to be up here with each one of you on council and for our citizens that are here this, this evening. A peaceful assemblage where we can all respect each other, disagree on items, but leave from here and shake each other's hands. God bless America for sure, hey? So I have the privilege this evening to read a proclamation, and then we're going to jump back into our agenda, as we normally do. So I would like to start out reading this proclama proclamation for North Shore Schools Foundation. It's a little bit uh, long, so bear with me in my, my ability to read through this. So this is a proclamation that I have the honor to read this evening. Whereas the North Shore School Foundation exists to raise funds and build partnerships to support academic success and excellence for all North Shore students for career and or college readiness. And whereas the North Shore Schools Foundation has established the following priorities to direct NSD funding through a grant program for district-wide curriculum enhancements, innovative classroom grants, scholarship for teachers pursuing national board teacher certification, as well as Liter literacy and art science. It's funny I stumbled on that word. Thank you. Uh, Ingemore High School grad, by the way. Don't hold that against me. Technology, engineering and math, advancing and disadvantaged learners, and health and enrichment. And whereas the North Shore Schools Foundation represents the public arm of support for public education in North Shore area operating separate from the North Shore School District and plays a key role in North Shore School District's recognition as one of the top school districts in Washington State and across the nation. And whereas the North Shore Schools Foundation has granted over $1 million to schools in the North Shore School District, funding programs and resources that benefit every student at least seven to nine times during their school career from kindergarten through high school. And whereas the North Shore Schools Foundation is funded solely through private contributions made annually through all of all in for kids fall campaign and the fight light a fire for learning luncheon and milk money campaign and other events and whereas their North Shore Schools Foundation has mobilized a significant volunteer effort of over 200 people to support the mission of the foundation and in all North Shore School District schools and now, therefore, I, Joshua Freed, Mayor of the City of Bothell, do hereby proclaim September 2014 as the North Shore Schools Foundation Month. Thank you so much. I'm going to come down and present this to you. Look really official. Thank you. So my name is Carmen Delzell and I'm the director of the North Shore Schools Foundation and we really appreciate you taking time to acknowledge the hard work that many of the parents and community members put in to support our excellent school district. We appreciate so much that the city of Bothell would stand behind us and that that is just yet another proof of the partnership that comes between cities and schools and we're just par really proud to be part of this community and it's really fun to have your children and even you as alumni as part of our community. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So I'm actually an alumni of um, Maywood Elementary, then North Shore <laughs> Junior High? No. Oh. Canyon Park. Canyon Park. And then Ingemore High School, 92. So thank you so much for your leadership in the community and impacting all of our students within the North Shore School District. So jumping into the rest of our agenda, hopefully Council's had an opportunity to look through the projected agenda. Any comments? Councilmember Sandberg? Last night I had the opportunity and pleasure to represent the City of Bothell at uh, the Mount Lake Terrace City Council meeting where the Association of Washington Cities honored Derek Stanford, Representative Derek Stanford, for being a municipal champion um, in supporting causes that are uh, 
important for cities, especially given um, the state legislative um, uh, direction in taking away certain revenues. And so um, Derek Stanford has been really instrumental in um, fighting for the Public Works Trust Fund. Um, and so I talked about how um, we had been, we've been a recipient of a sizable Public Works Trust Fund loan for the Crossroads and how that was great for economic development and great as a regional transportation corridor. And I had the opportunity to talk to Representative Stanford and he he said uh, he, he said that he would like to um, meet with council um, in terms of talking about um, issues that are of interest to um, that where we can work um, together on issues that are important to the city um, and um, we had talked earlier about doing our, making our legislative agenda earlier um, rather than later we've historically had legislative agenda um, come as a topic to, to us in January but that's really too late he was saying that as committee chairs they start to meet um, by late November and start setting agenda and so um, waiting until January um, and going with the AWC isn't really effective for us and so um, we talked about the possibility of having um, all three representatives, uh, uh, Representative St Stanford and Moscoso and Senator McAuliffe, come and talk mm -hmm. maybe at a study session um, where we can, you know, use that opportunity to, to talk with each other about um, our priorities. And so I was looking on the projected agenda thinking about, you know, when, when could we have that discussion and we don't have a study session in November. Our, our only our next study session is only in October. Do you have one on the twenty fifth of November? Oh, the one that got rescheduled. Oh, rescheduled. Due to holiday. Yeah. So um, I'm wondering if um, we would like to invite um, the three uh, our three representatives to come to one of our study sessions either in October or November. Um, and we can have a discussion with them and be thinking about what our legislative priorities are um, and get on the on the map while they're thinking about it versus maybe when it's too late. Yep. And then they can share with us what they feel their constraints are and what their challenges are and we can share with them, you know, what what we would like to to have happen. Absolutely. I'm certainly in agreement. October or November, maybe November twenty fifth. Uh, that might be an odd time because it's right around um, holiday break. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, we don't. It doesn't have to be at a study session. I just I think that it's it's important to invite them um, to a meeting that we have before the end of November. I'm just getting everybody's agenda lined up is difficult, so maybe we leave it to our city manager to work with the three legislative offices to find a time that mutually helps the all three show up to our meeting because it would be nice to have all three representatives at the same time. So I think it's a great idea. Is anybody opposed or everybody in favor of that? Okay. Anything else? I jumped ahead of schedule. We're supposed to talk about the meeting agenda tonight, but since we're already on projected agenda, anybody else on that item? No. How about tonight's meeting agenda? Any changes? Councilmember Sandberg? I'd like to add 15 minutes to the um, 14-143 capital facilities plan discussion. 143? Mm-hmm. 15 minutes, so a total of 45 minutes? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And I think one of our most popular items this evening is that we already scheduled for an hour and 15 minutes. Based upon the number of people in this room, we may adjust as we're receiving public comment. So we'll see how it goes. Do we, do we want to move that up any earlier in the evening? Consent. How many people are here this evening for the uh, Bothellway Apartments Widener conversation? If you raise your hand, if you are Widener, no. How about for uh, Planning Commission vote? New. How about Petite Final Design Multiway Boulevard? Do we have consultants here this evening for that vote, Dave? No. So I'm certainly in favor of moving that up. I, I'm guessing with a number of people I see in the room that are familiar to this issue, the public hearing considering potential po uh, plan and code amendments. 
to the Bothell connector between 228th. How many people are here for that? Okay. I'm certainly in favor of moving that up. Is everybody else? Okay. So after our consent agenda conversation, the items that may come from there. Any other comments? No? So we do have a visitor section this evening, and this uh, is an opportunity for citizens to address council in a three-minute segment to bring up topics that are important to you. There will be an opportunity to have public comment on items later in the evening. Uh, for instance, the one that we just moved further up the line. So if you have comments on the Bothaway connector, et cetera, you can reserve those for when we bring that next agenda build item up. Do we have a sign-up sheet for visitor section so far this evening? All right, maybe Sherman can bring it in. There are no visitor's comments this evening. Bill, are you with the visitor's comments? You are. So if you would come forward, Mr. Moritz, and we'll just hand off your visitor section. Anybody else who may uh, address council, I'll just ask you to raise your hands at a certain time, and we'll call you forward. Let me grab those for me just so I have everybody's name. Mr. Moritz, you do have three minutes. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. I'm here on uh, two things I'd like to talk about. Uh, the first is... Uh, the information that's available on the city's website and other material related to the bond issue that's going to be voted on in November. Um, the city's web page says that you can get all the facts there. And when I dig down through that, there's one thing that's missing and that I find people are very interested in, and that is the cost of the individual projects. Uh, I can't find that anywhere on the city's website. I went to two of the three open houses in June. It wasn't there. Someone else that I know went to the third open house. It wasn't there either. Uh, there's been no information put out about the breakdown of the cost. Total price, yes, but not the breakdown. And so I find when I talk to people, they're interested to know that the biggest, almost 50% of the bond has to do with the multiway. And that 67% total is for roads. You're calling them public spaces, but they're roads. And only 33% is going to parks. So I would encourage you to add this information to the uh, website and other documents. It's also not in the, in the flyer that you sent out uh, announcing the meetings. Second thing has to do with... Uh, something I've been going through the voting with voter list in anticipation of this election. And <clears throat> someone suggested that perhaps some of the senior staff in the city don't live within the city. So I went through the voter list and using the city manager's uh, executive leadership team, there are nine people. And their names are not important, it's the office that I'm concerned about. So I went through the list <clears throat> and it turns out that much to my surprise, only two of the nine people are registered to vote in the city of Bothell. One is the public works director, and one is the director of uh, community development. And I think that's fantastic because those two staff members, I think, have a great deal, a great impact on what happens in our city. But there's one person significantly missing, and that's the city manager. And I understand originally, when he was hired before many of you were on the council, uh, that was a condition of employment, but that was excused, and I don't know why. And I guess I would encourage you at your first opportunity to make that a condition of employment for the city manager. Thank you. Yeah, curious, how did you receive the numbers um, that you put up? Did you Were those from the city or something that you created a Excel spreadsheet for? Um, which, which ones, Mayor? The first, uh, maybe the second slide that you put up okay, had well, numbers on there. The, That's right. Okay. This is from your agenda bill, Okay. page four, from yep. the May 20th meeting. Okay. I thought you said the numbers weren't available, but so you just well, had to dig down and find them. That, that, that agenda packet is no longer available on the website. Okay. I think it should be directly, when you, when you punch get all the facts, mm -hmm. the people should be able to see where the dollars are going. Great. All right. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Moritz. Second on the sign-up sheet is Mr. Jim Jameson, I believe is the name. Mr. Jamison, we thank you so much. We have your address for the record. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Um, my name is Jim Jamison. I've lived in the Bothell area for nearly 30 years. 
I currently am the owner of Foggy Noggin Brewing. Uh, we're just outside the city limits in, we have a Bothell address, but we are unincorporated Snohomish County. Been open for four and a half years. For the last year, we've been looking for a location in Bothell to expand our brewery. Had a lot of uh, difficulty in finding a location that would be able to have a production brewery and have a tasting in the same location. Um, found an area that I think is very beneficial to not only to Bothell, but to like businesses like us on East Riverside Drive on the north side. Impacts about 12 um, lots. It's a very mixed use. There's no residential. It's all commercial currently. Um, perfect location. It's also the gateway between Bothell and Woodenville, which Woodenville has opened their doors and, as you know, you know 100 plus wineries. They have six breweries. They have distilleries. It really takes all of the, um, the activity of what Bothell residents want to do when they want to have something to do other than be at home makes them leave the town. Living 30 years, you know, my wife and I, we want to go do something. We say, where are we going to go? Well, there's nothing in Bothell. We want to keep people in Bothell. We want Bothell to be a day in a lifetime. We want people to enjoy it. All my kids went to Bothell High School. I contribute to the Bothell programs. Um, we're a key sponsor. We're in the program for their football program. And um, we want to stay here. Being approached by, you know, the neighboring communities, Kenmore, Woodenville, Snohomish as a few, and they want me to go there. I want, I'm committed to staying to Bothell, but I don't have time. So I'm really looking for uh, help on getting this code change so there's allowed uses in that area, those 12 properties that we can attract other breweries, other wineries, and make that a, a destination between Woodenville and Bothell and keep people and keep their dollars in Bothell. Great, Mr. Jamison, thank you. It's interesting, I was just spoke at the uh, Biomedical Device Summit, which was held at Cascadia Community College, University of Washington, actually University of Washington Science Building, and you were one of the sponsors. I was with the sponsor. And of all the sponsors that were announced, you actually got a, an ovation. So people were happy to have you there. You know, as far as bringing a community together as well, my current location is in a residential area. It's completely residential. And what I've really done is we've been able to make it a community involvement. This is where neighbors who haven't talked to each other ever have found each other, found friendships, and they look forward to coming to our, our brewery on the weekends, getting to know each other. It's really created a great environment. Uh, I Thanks for your time. That. Absolutely. Councilmember Sandberg had a question, if you're up for it. Excuse me. Um, so what, what specifically is the code change that you are seeking? It's, it's allowing the use of those properties for brewery production, winery production, and tasting. So it's not a, a change in the zoning code. It's a change um, in allowing a permitted use to occur. So that area you said is mixed use, and if it's kind of like OPLI, kind of a mix of things. And right now, that brewery production is just not a permitted use. So that's the change you're asking the for? The brewery production and, and the retail traffic are not permitted. OK. Um, well, you know, given that Woodenville is down the road and Woodenville um, stands for wine or represents wine, it'd be great that Bothell could stand for biomedical devices and beer. Um, <laughs> I think that I think that would be a great branding, kind of unusual, but I'm sure the biomed people would really like that. Thank you. Um, um, I would. Um, I, w I would support that coming forward to us as a discussion item, um, but I would really encourage you reaching out to the the neighborhood in that area um, along Riverside Drive because north of Riverside Drive, the north side of Riverside Drive, is n mostly non-residential and very mixed use. But there's a lot of residential south of. Um, Riverside Drive and so um, do you have plans to to reach out to that community and and tell them what it is you're thinking and and getting their support because it makes it a lot easier for us up here to make a change when we know that the people who live in the area are also supportive well based on you know the response and the acceptance I would have from the council um, it'd be interesting to invite people into the location the building in particular we're looking at um, you know, have a kind of like open house in there and talking about what we're planning on doing and, you know, who wouldn't mind a, a taste of beer to, to talk things over? Who wouldn't mind? <laughs> exactly. Well, great. So if you're, if you're planning that, that would be, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? 
Council Member Evans. I just have a question of staff. Is uh, Can the code amendment come directly back to the council, or does that have to go through the comprehensive plan or docketing process? That's a matter of anticipation of this matter coming before council this evening that I um, have asked our community development director. Unfortunately, he's not able to be here this evening, so staff could bring that information back okay. to council. At this point, um, that is something that's being processed through our comp plan, um, and code amendments that are that are due to come back to you next year. Um, however, we'll, we're researching whether or not it can come back to you in advance of that. Great. Well, just if if somebody, if the council is interested in hearing that, if somebody could explain to Mr. Jamison later on what that process might be and what the time period might be and that type of thing, I think would be good information for you to have. Deputy Mayor. Great. Thank you. Um, well, also explain to all of us up here the process and the time frame as well now um, if I remember correctly there's a bed and breakfast on the south side of East Riverside Drive in that area and so it, there's hospitality um, businesses over there already so I'm I would be in full support of uh, looking at this and moving forward especially if there's a way to do it in advance of the comp plan amendment We have a lot of nodding heads, City Manager. Mr. Jamison, thank you so much for coming this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the sign-up sheet is Paul Streisauer. Yes. I'm sorry if I didn't say that correctly. Oh, that's perfect. So uh, my name is Paul Streisauer. My wife and I own a commercial building on East Riverside Drive. Um, we had uh, Jim over, and we were discussing the kind of things that you know he would need for the brewery operation, and pretty much the. The first floor of the building, it's a high bay flex space and would work very well for the brewery. Everything he needs is already there. And uh, we, um, the second floor of the building, uh, we have been using for to host events, uh, mainly winemaker dinners where we bring in uh, local chefs and uh, Washington wineries and pair them up and it has been uh, a lot of fun and brings people to Bothell. And uh, the particular area where we are there, I mean, we have industrial uses on one, actually on both sides of us, with Kent Gypsum on one side. Uh, the other side is a warehouse that uh, Seattle Home Appliance uses. Uh, across the street is the B&B &B East in the States, which was mentioned. Uh, and a lot of senior housing, and there are there are some residents on uh, Eason uh, Street. Um, but it appears that uh, you know the impact of having a brewery at that location will be minimal. And I uh, talked with uh, Sean and Beth today, who uh, run Eason Estates. They would love to have uh, uh, Jim there uh, brewing beer. That currently. The majority of their business is from uh, people that uh, for wine tourism. The people come there and they go into Woodenville, and uh, so um, it, anyway, it would be uh, great. I think you know Bothell could benefit from the tourism and uh, economics of you know having beer here in Bothell, and uh, perhaps we can. You know, as, as Jim mentioned, uh, have, uh, you know, beer and wine production and tasting is an allowed use on the north side of East Riverside Drive. It's already a designated commercial area. Um, and it's sort of the gateway to downtown Bothell and, you know, everything that's happening here and the restaurants and shops and then recreational facilities here. So thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, sir. Anybody else from the public that would like to address council this evening? If so, just raise your hand or Okay. That would conclude our section in regards to visitors. Uh, moving on, we are at our consent agenda. Typically we don't have comments on the consent agenda. I didn't have I forgot to state it, but in A B fourteen one thirty eight, I think there was a hope to for me to have some detail that would be put in that in regards to the costs that are accumulating to the $193,000.
I can't make any motion in that regard. Uh, I'll pull that and make a mo I'll make a motion to pull fourteen one thirty eight and approve the balance of the consent agenda. So we have a motion by Councilmember Lamb and a second by Councilmember Agnew. If everybody could place their vote, and the clerk can display passes unanimously. So AB fourteen one thirty eight, Councilmember Lamb. Yeah. So the mayor had asked me to um, to comment on this item, and I think the this the question is, and I think this is to our city attorney, is whether or not is if in fact the cost of that is is an accurate estimate that because it seems like a high amount for the project. If it is, I don't have any objection to that. I don't think the mayor does either. If it's not. Just to make sure that there's a, it's a one for one exchange for value rather than um, that they sort of submit a reimbursement for the cost uh, in terms of the credit. So for the benefit of the public and other uh, other council members, the proposed agreement is granting a facility charge credit to a developer in exchange for them doing uh, potable water system improvements. And I think the estimated value was one hundred and ninety three thousand um, dollars. I'm not sure where that estimate is from, but I think the idea that the mayor had, which I support, is to say if it is in fact one hundred and ninety three thousand dollars that's that's fine, but that there should be some sort of documentation or exchange back and forth. And I don't know that that was completely addressed in there. And, and I don't know if this is time sensitive, there's something that needs to be approved this week or if it's something that could come back um, at our October meeting. Uh, well, it helps us here if we have questions. Yeah, I'm hoping. We, I think we have somebody here from um, Public Works that can uh, can address the the details. But um, this was something that I considered when we reviewed it to make sure that there's not a gift of public funds. Um, and in looking over it, um, it seemed to meet the criteria as a fair exchange. Um, but as far as to exact dollars, I would have to have uh, somebody from Public Works address that issue. But I, I believe that that was looked at. So if, if uh, we have somebody here that can address that, um, I can back them up on that. So we leave Dave Phelps, Public Works Senior Civil Engineer, and Don Fien is here as well. Hello. Um, so the, uh, the project that we're calling for is for um, – a PRV and about, um, I believe it's a 300 feet of, uh, of uh, water pipe for the, uh, that would eventually be um, extended upon so that we could hook up to the city system uh, the, so we wouldn't be have, having to buy from uh, North Shore in the future, which would be a significant savings. And um, the... Uh, the project would be um, we, we we will get uh, estimates from the from the uh, developer and we will review them as as it, it comes in as far as the actual cost. But at this time, we have that's the best available estimate we have. So, is the amount as it's currently drafted? Is it not to exceed that amount, or that's our estimate, or it could be more or less depending on what the actual cost comes back at? I think that that's on the high end of the estimate. So the so it's the contract it, it, is currently the drafted provides that it would come back down if if it could it okay. could be lower. And they're going to have to verify the the yeah, amount. Yeah, we're going to verify it. Pocket. We can okay. have a consultant review it for. Okay, then I I will move approval of this. If there's no other questions from I have a question. council, or I, I guess. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking at the distance, and I would have guessed it's about 120 feet. But you said 300 feet. I'm just looking at the width of the lots. It includes the, it looks like the bridge that goes across the stream. So would the cost of the pipe be included, or the cost of the bridge be included in the 193, or is it no, strictly the water pipe? It's just the water pipe. The bridge is uh, being paid for entirely by the developer. Okay. It's just the uh, water main is the only uh, portion, the water main and the PRV is the only portion that uh, the developer is getting credit for. So the going rate for a water main right now is at 8-inch ductile iron. You know, it's a it, it would it's about uh, three hundred a lineal foot around that for every if you count all the count all the appurtenances and everything else and what it works out per foot. I pay about one hundred and twenty dollars a square foot or a lineal foot. 
that uh, 300 is what we would get what for our if, if we bid it out if we, we hopefully you know hopefully we can get lower with the developer than we would if we would have to bid it out it's also it's a 12 inch main not an 8 inch right it's 12 inch as far as the so 300 times 3,000 still doesn't get to meet a 193 so the no, PR the, is where it's pressure, the pressure reducing valve station is what that's really the the big ticket item well we'd be curious to see the whole accounting for it and unit pricing because it, it was uh, quite a high ticket number for me but any other questions from council okay. councilmember Evans so the, what is the process going to be? Is the contractor, if, if whatever action the council takes on this, it, is the contractor going to be authorized to go ahead and do that line and then we'll come back to us with what that cost is or is he going to give you a cost estimate ahead of time or how do we control the cost or have? He, he will have to give it to us ahead of time. So we'll know what that cost right. is ahead of time. Right. And if it's out of line, for a 12 inch water main or something then you're going to you know what a prv valve and that stuff's going to be you're going to at that point say wait a minute this isn't penciling out we're not going to do it is that correct sure. right okay that would be correct so mayor i i guess the uh, or council member lamb i guess the um the motion would be to approve this not to exceed that amount and be based on actual costs is there something I'll, like I'll that? I'll second that motion. Okay. Would you like to address your motion? Yes, I, I, I think the concept's a good concept. We're getting some work done here that, that we need an additional 300 or up to 300 feet of 12-inch line that, that's necessary there. He's going to be in the area working, and uh, that makes sense. Uh, but, but I think some of the questions that have been raised are good questions, and I think we want to just – we're willing to pay, but we want to, want to pay what the fair cost is and, and not a increased cost. So, so my motion again was to uh, authorize this uh, this uh, amount up to one hundred ninety three thousand dollars, with um, not to exceed one hundred ninety three thousand dollars, and to uh, based on actual cost of installation is. What I'm trying to get to is what the bottom line is on this. Okay. Thank you. Any further comment on the motion? Councilmember Sandberg? Um, yeah, I, I support that because it was my understanding that um, I understand that maybe public works, when they have to bid out a project, they have to pay a higher cost because they have prevailing wages. But part of the benefit was having the developer do this at their wages, at their cost structure, not at our cost structure. So... Um, I, it's based on their actual construction costs, not what it would be if Public Works was supposed would bid this out as a public project. That, that's what you're saying. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Good. Any further comment? All right. Seeing none, the motion is to approve crediting water facility charges for Piper's Glen development against the actual cost of water system improvements up to one hundred ninety-three thousand dollars. All in favor can place their vote. And clerk display passes unanimously. And let the record also show that Deputy Mayor showed up probably just 10 minutes after the hour, I think. I don't know if you noted that. Okay, great. Next item on the agenda we bumped up forward, which is AB uh, 14142, a public hearing to consider potential plan of code amendments concerning the Bothell connector alignment between 228th and 240th Street Southeast and plan designations and development regulations for portions of the Fitzgerald 35th Southeast and Canyon <coughs> Creek 39th Southeast sub areas. So I will formally open the public hearing. And it looks like we have Bruce Blackburn with us this evening. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor, Council members, and members of the public. Tonight, this is a public hearing on the 2014 plan and code amendments, specifically regarding the Bothell Connector, Fitzgerald 35th Southeast Subarea, Canyon Creek 39th Southeast Subarea, LID, or Low Impact Development Overlay Regulations. Now, this evening, we're going to address two items. The first, of course, is the reassessment of the location of the Bothell Connector, 
which is a roadway that connects 240th Street Southeast with 228th Street Southeast in a planned alignment of 39th Avenue Southeast. And when I say planned, that's what shows in our comprehensive plan. The second aspect would be to address concerns of property owners who have identified that developers have not pursued development within land subject to the low impact development overlay regulations within those two sub areas due to their complexity and some difficulty of implementation. Now, I think at this point I'm going to turn it over to Steve Morikawa, who is much more familiar with the Bothell Connector provisions, and then I'll follow it up with the rest of the LID provisions. Thanks. Uh, good evening. Um, so the Bothell Connector project has a history that's actually longer than the 2003 date put up there. Um, in the 1980s, it was all in, in unincorporated Snohomish County. And it was a project back then that they planned to break through and put this about 3,000 linear feet of road to connect uh, 39th Avenue at 228th to the intersection at uh, 240th. Um, however, in about 2000, 2003 or so, the city recognizing the need in this area um, because of the growth uh, occurring um, to the north, um, partnered with Snohomish County to move it forward. It's located about halfway in Snohomish County and halfway in the city proper. There was a public process at the time that involved looking at several alternatives, including a no-build alternative, and the project actually was put on a regional transportation funding package in 2007 called the RTID, Regional Transportation Investment District. It was one of the smaller projects on that package, um, but the package did not get voted through. So the project is sitting at about 60% design. Uh, we've completed enough design to identify right-of-way needs. Snohomish County has actually, the council at Snohomish County has actually adopted the right-of-way plan within the county area. Um, but no further design has taken place because of the lack of funding. Um, the project of this size, it's about, hang on, sorry. The project of this size is about 60 to $80 million. Maybe I should go back. It's about 60 to $80 million. Um, a lot of the cost is associated with environmental impacts and mitigation and having to buy land to do those mitigations on, as well as um, buying land for the right-of-way because it is a new road and doesn't necessarily follow an existing right-of-way alignment. Um, and to some extent as well, treating stormwater, which requires stormwater ponds and, and land as well. Uh, the reason for the 60 to $80 million range is because property prices have a big influence on where this cost would be, and we haven't had a, you know, an opportunity to go back and re-verify things like that. Um, let's go on to the next one. Next. So the question that I think the council posted was, if we we're not to build the Bothell connector, would we be able to make the traffic system work in this area? And the answer is yes, um, with some caveats. Um, there would need to be roadway intersection improvements along the 35th corridor and 228th and 240th because that would be kind of the default arterial or minor arterial. And that in itself would cost some funds. Um, We've tried to do a preliminary planning estimate, and right now, again, we still have those right-of-way things. We would need to figure out what the market is out there. But we're in the range of maybe 40 to $50 million to do um, improvements. And I'll list the improvements later. Um, if we don't build the 39th Avenue connector, 35th would likely have to be designated as a minor arterial. Um, the travel times through the corridor would be longer because instead of going straight through 3,000 feet, you'd have to, you know, if you're coming from the north, you'd have to take a right turn, go along 228th, then do your 3,000 south route, then make another turn and get on 39th, make another turn as well. And then the corridor itself wouldn't be as predictable. I mean, there are arterials in the region I come from Seattle, and you can see a lot of them, that the arterials don't necessarily follow a straight line, which is very predictable, and people don't have to look right or left to turn on other streets in order to get back on an arterial. And we call that predictability, and typically it, it kind of translates a little bit into safety because people don't have to make as many turns when they're going through the corridor. And then finally, if you build the Botha connector, it kind of draws some traffic away from 45th, 
um, 35th, obviously, and a little bit from Fitzgerald. So their converse is true. If you don't build it, you're going to get higher traffic volumes on those adjacent parallel streets. This is a couple of tables um, that kind of illustrate what, what happens out there. So the first table on the top there are volumes, average daily traffic, and the top row there is existing traffic approximately on Fitzgerald Road at 6,000, 35th Avenue at 6,500, and 45th Avenue at 4,200. The next row down basically describes what would happen if you don't build a Bothell connector, and then the next row down kind of describes what would happen if you do build a Bothell connector. So like we said, as you can see, the volumes on those three streets would increase, and obviously 35th would take the biggest hit because that would become the minor arterial by default. With that being said, if we do some improvements on the existing roadways, we can make the level of service work, and we can achieve uh, a level of service in 2035 that we need to be at. Uh, let's see. So this slide is a little, got a lot going on in the slide, but the key thing to look at is the white line, which is the straight through version, and then the colored line, which is basically following an existing route. So some of the improvements that would need to be um, done in order to make this work, and again, this would have to be over a period of time by 2035 when we get the traffic volumes. We'd have to work on each of the various intersections. They get different improvements at each. They would probably either be signalized Two of them are already, or perhaps a roundabout. Um, some of them would have to add turn lanes, that sort of thing, to make them work. 228 between 35th and 39th would have to be at least four lanes, maybe even five, um, because we would have to start preparing for perhaps double left turns in directions, so you need eventually get to that width. 35th Avenue itself, we can actually make it a three-lane arterial, not a five-lane arterial. So you would have one lane in each direction and a center turn lane. And then 240th on the bottom there would have to be improved to at least a three-lane arterial itself. Um, so that's kind of where we are. Great. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. Bruce, do you have further, further presentations? Well, I was going to go into the LID provisions themselves. However, it's, I'd leave it up to the council if they wanted to take some questions about the Bothell connector or... I think what we do is go straight through the presentation then give the public the opportunity to ask questions or make comments, and then we can come back to council for questions. Fair enough. I'll go right into my uh, presentation then. Thank you. Now, the Fitzgerald Canyon Creek LID overlay regulations started when the property owners came to the city expressing their concerns. And staff interviewed three development companies who had previously expressed interest in developing within the LID provision, but chose not to undertake those developments. And we decided to talk to them about to, if they would identify their issues with the LID regulations, try and get a feel for that. And the developers identified a number of areas. One was the uncertainty of the regulations. They found that many aspects of the LID overlay are uncertain, too complex, or could be interpreted in different ways. They were worried about the deduction of certain facilities, specifically surface water facilities, that basically take away their dwelling unit yield calculation or lot areas. They were also concerned about the impervious surface limitations. There's basically some provisions within the LID that say you'll only have a certain amount of impervious surface that you're allowed. Uh, they were concerned that those provisions were very complex and also had a tendency to knock down their development potential even further. They're also concerned about the forest land cover provisions, about the amount that they were, as well as the regulations were, again, very detailed, very scientific, but also kind of confusing. They, of course, they mentioned the wildlife corridors. There was some language about crossing wildlife corridors that was very difficult to comply with, and they were really worried about that, which all led to, of course, the 39th Avenue connector, which we've already had a little discussion about. Now, at the study session on July the 8th, the council asked staff a few questions that they wanted to have answered. One is that the council was looking for what was the existing forest cover within the R5400A areas. Now, unfortunately, we couldn't do a forest cover calculation because, you know, that would involve a site inspection and some of those things. But we did tra measure the tree canopy, and essentially what we did is we took an ARC GIS graphic information system, and we just outlined where we found tree canopy. And again, I want to note that tree canopy is not necessarily forest cover. In fact, if you were going to look at the 47% is probably the highest you could possibly be. There are probably some areas underneath that tree canopy that is not true forest. 
And when I say forest, I mean all the elements of a forest, which is the trees, the understory vegetation, the organic matter or forest stuff, as well as undisturbed soils below that. The council also asked whether we could apply the 2012 Ecology Service Water Manual. And the Washington State Department of Ecology provides service water manual updates that basically have higher levels of service and higher levels of protections within those. And the city can certainly implement those through uh, the Public Works Director Authority to adopt them underneath the uh, Bothell standards. The other thing the council asked for is what was the existing critical area and critical air buffer area coverage within the 5400A areas. And that's basically about 40% of the lands classified R 5400A, assuming a 100-foot buffer. And again, remember, this is based upon the information we have right now, not an individual site assessment. So there could be higher or lower as we get into the more detailed provisions. Finally, the council asked, has the fish and wildlife habitat within the, the North Creek Fish and Wildlife Critical Habitat Area, or the Nick Fuchapa, degraded since 2006, and 2006 is when we did a lot of the studies in here. And I discussed this with our, uh, our service water people, and they do believe there has been some degradation. However, the area still has the best fish and wildlife habitat within the city of Bothell. Now, within your packet, you have a number of staff proposed approaches to these LID issues identified the developers. Of course, one, of course, would be to simplify the over a LID over language by using more terms familiar with laypersons, remove some of those really complex provisions, and use terminology from other citywide regulations that people are more familiar with. The other proposal would be to allow service water facilities to be credited toward lot or dwelling unit yield. That's not something that we usually do here. However, in this case, because we're doing LID or low impact development, those kind of facilities take up more land area than your more traditional surface water provisions. And instead of serving as a disincentive to do that, we don't want to basically have a situation where they don't want to do LID because it basically takes away dwelling unit numbers. We would also um, remove the effective impervious surface area regulations and in lieu of that implement the latest Department of Ecology Surface Water Design Manual 2012, which basically represents the best management practices out there. Also, we would implement a 40% forest land re retention creation cover requirement. And again, the existing tree, company is about, tree canopy is about 47%. We will revise the site and building design standards to make them easier to understand to implement and to remove impediments to modern plat and housing construction practices. And finally, we'd make clarifications within the wildlife corridor regulations to make it clear that road and utility crossings are acceptable when you do certain things, best management practices, minimizing the crossing. So that concludes my introductory presentation. Uh, we can go with pre uh, questions or we can go to the uh, public testimony. Thank Let's you. Go to public testimony. Yes, sir. Great. Thank you so much to both of you. I appreciate it. First on our sign up sheet, and we could probably have the lights back on. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Gene Grieve, a familiar face to council. It's been a while, though. Mr. Grieve, nice to see you. We have your address already. As you know, I've been active in Stonehenge County as a county resident to see how the county and the cities work together. Uh, the, I've been with the, prior to this slide, I go back to 1985. This is when the Bothell Connector, then known as the 39th Avenue Southeast, when it all started, it was considered a critical project. Uh, it was in three phases. Now, phase one and two are essentially complete. Uh, phase one was the uh, realignment at the intersection of Mulkey Road and, and uh, 39th. As we know, uh, the rest of the improvement on uh, it's sort of a lash up because the citizens in the county are coughing up millions of dollars of frontage improvements. I've objected to the county uh, sometime to get a fair budget to work with the city to move ahead on. And I think alternative two right now is our best bet. Uh, I think alternative two in the, in the EIS, I'm not sure. I think this is the. Well, it's alternative two is the jog, is the as they describe, and if we're going to do something, we're we're desperate. I, I live along 39th, 
and uh, we, we need to move quick and uh, with the cooperation of the entire corridor. Uh, that, that would include 35th uh, north of Maltby. We should tie this to an entire corridor. Uh, 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 ladies and gentlemen, we, we are building a multi-million dollar high school along 35th, and uh, we're going to be subject to mass amount of traffic. Uh, my other quick comment is with regards to the LID. I can't make any comments as to the specific LID, but I did testify this when, when the LID was adopted. Uh, this is the North Creek Watershed Management Plan. Uh, this is dated 1993. Uh, Everett, uh, and we did conduct, citizens did conduct a citizen effort to Everett, Mill Creek, and uh, Bothell and the county to work together to come up with a watershed plan to solve North Creek. This should not be a postage stamp, a heroic uh, effort by Bothell. Uh, Bothell has exhibited responsibility uh, in its management, but I can tell you the county is going crazy. We are adapting growth ahead of our uh, infrastructure, and it's a fact of life. We're trying to meet the urban growth area, and we're not going to be growing uh, east. Uh, we're going to be uh, 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 building up where we are. So I encourage county, city cooperation for both the uh, LID or for our growth in, uh, uh, in the uh, bottle connector and the uh, in service water management. Great. Thank you, Mr. Grieve. Appreciate it. Uh, we have a quick question for Mr. Evans. Do you have a second, Mr. Grieve? Uh, Councilmember Evans has a question for you. Gene, I had a question for you. Over here, Gene. <laughs> Yeah, I see you. <laughs> okay. Um, have you tracked the traffic mitigation? I know you've been involved in this for a long time and, and are on top of a lot of things. Yeah, 1985. Are you aware of the traffic mitigation fees that have been generated in that area, that corridor along 39th? We tried to track. We tried to work with the county to uh, develop a vision for spending our money effectively. Right now, there has been some improvements with regards to bright water mitigation. That was quite a few million dollars. Uh, we expect some a significant mitigation from the high school. Uh, I think what the county has leaned on is frontage improvements. We did uh, campaign for a traffic signal at uh, 228th and, uh, uh, excuse me, to, uh, 212th and uh, 39th. So we're picking away at it, but it takes a lot of work. It took me weeks to get an appointment with Terry Ryan. Yeah. We've had a meeting with Terry Ryan to push the county to, um, to move to uh, paying more attention between in the unincorporated area. Thank you. I, as you know, there's a difference between the bright water mitigation money right. and traffic mitigation. I mean, those are different funds. Yeah, but they did, they did spend some money on sidewalk improvements on 45th. Yes, they and, did. And, 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 and plus they're doing some intersection improvements up north of uh, 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 two, uh, Multi Road. Great. Thank you. Th thank you. Great. Thank you. Next on our sign-up sheet is Martha Clatterberg or Clatterbaugh. Please correct me if I said your last name incorrectly. Yeah, my name is Martha Clatterbaugh, and uh, I just signed up in case I – wanted to say something. I'm really here to get information. But I would say that uh, when I moved to the Bothell area 10 years ago, one of the first meetings I ever attended was about this Bothell connector. And of course, that was, it was well along in the process by that time. I think it was the meeting that was in February of 2005. And so I've been watching as well as I could since then. I'm, I'm very concerned about what's happening and what's not happening, and, and I know you are too, but uh, I guess at this point I'm a little concerned, well, I'm more than a little concerned, that a plan that has already spent a lot of time, effort, money, could be abandoned for something that is not going to be nearly as effective and cost almost as much, it sounds like to me. You know, I, I haven't, I'm not like the gentleman before me who has been on this for years and years, but I just wanted to say I do have this concern and 
I will be continuing to watch it. And thank you for your time. Great. Thanks so much. Virginia Young. Welcome, Ms. Young. Yeah, Virginia Young. I've lived on 45th for 46 years, so you can imagine the changes I've seen. And I really appreciate the gentleman before Martha because he's so well informed. I'm only informed as a citizen that's been watching this since the beginning. And my huge concerns living on 45th with the traffic that we see and the development, as been mentioned, that's going on north of us. And I, I don't know the dollar numbers, but I, what I heard was 60 to 80, I think. And then I heard another proposal that went to 40. And I don't know if that's accurate, but what I thought was 20 million isn't that much to have it be done correctly and something that's going to serve us well in the future because we haven't been served well in the past by the government entities that haven't been able to come up with the solution so far. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Mr. Spaulding, Dave Spaulding, we have your address for the record. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, I'm going to make this very short and brief, but uh, just coming here tonight, coming down 228th, I live all the way on the other side over here. Just coming down here, the traffic was stopped from about QSC all the way down to Fitzgerald Road, and I know it's probably you know even further than that on up. It uh, planning seems to be a problem, and I've seen this time and time again when they were putting 405 over the top and they were widening it, putting 228th, doing something, and it all came and it goes from four lanes into two lanes under the bridge, 405, and then it kind of blossoms back out and they put in nice sidewalks, but it's still two lanes. This, the, you gotta have something that goes east, west, north, south. And it's, it just makes plain good sense. And you've already spent money like these folks have talked about and please do something with it. <laughs> you have to do something with it because it's, and I've lived here for, I don't know, 30, 37 years or so, but it's something's got to be done. It's, you're getting into a, a choke point all over the place. So that's about it. <laughs> My two bits. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Spaulding. Appreciate it. Carol er Erickson? Thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carol Erickson. I live at 22816 35th Avenue Southeast. And um, I thought we were also going to be talking about density in the area. Um, I don't know what it is anymore in that area. It used to be rural conservation, which was like two and a half acres per residence, which was a little much. And Maybe it's been reduced since then. Half acre is a lot, I'll tell you. I've had half an acre and it's a lot of property. Anyway, but as to the traffic, as we all know, it's horrific everywhere. I can't go anywhere after about 4 o'clock, <laughs> you know, or I can't go anywhere at 8 o'clock in the morning. So, um, and about the Bothell Connector, I heard it was impossible to do that because there's a big ravine in there and water and everything else. So. I, I'm not sure why we're still even talking about that, if it's a viable project or not. So um, anyway, thank you for your efforts, and I hope uh, we can figure out a way to get more north, south, east, west traffic uh, options as well. There ought to be a way to get it a little better. Thank Great. you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Next on my list is Tina Williams. Ms. Williams, we already have your address for the record. No point of repeating. Hi, everyone. I'm a new property owner on 35th Avenue. And if we could go to the page on your map, um, Steve, the page on your map where you had the red dots and the blue dots and how 39th <laughs> would look and where the changes would be to 35th. Okay. Yes. Am I allowed to walk over here? I don't have a point. Uh, the, the difficulty is we have to record our conversations, and so we have our microphone point. that restricts our mobility okay. <laughs> so if you, there you go laser pointer is perfect yes. I'm new to this so thank you so I'm a new property owner and this is one of my pieces right here and I would like to ask if anyone could answer my questions of 
the plan that's going on where 39th is in this direction doesn't seem to go through residential areas as bad as 35th. And those of us that own the land on 35th, mine in particular has water, so I do have restrictions. And I'm zoned R40,000, one home per one acre. And um, we look all the way up here, and you have R4,000. So you have 10 homes per one acre. So I would like to know, for those of us that are property owners, and we've been having these restrictions for so long, if you do plan to make this change along 35th, I'd like to know what the development changes would be for those of us that have just one acre lots or more. Because for me, my hands are tied. And I do not want any of my four little children waiting up here for a school bus when the road is already 35 miles an hour and the cars are zooming by. Now if we're going to have a divided road, I have to worry about transportation. And I think that the proposal of 39th, if you drive into 236 and up, it's all heavily forested, so I understand why the forest restrictions are looking to be uh, lifted. But those of us that are over here have, have just such little to do with our land. And then you have gigantic um, development over here, you have a gigantic development over here, on 228th over here, gigantic development. So all this has been done but then what are the rest of us left to do? And so I kind of would like Steve or Bruce maybe to tell me, and maybe I'm uneducated and I apologize because I'm new to this area, but I'd like to know what can we do, and I certainly am not in favor of coming along this street that's already fast enough. We have a lot of driveways that come in and out of this, and at a speed limit of 35, I can't imagine how much faster you would allow it to be coming down this road if you change it to a three-lane road anyway. Can I ask those questions? Can they be answered or um, is this the time? I think the <gasps> folks from staff have taken your questions and can certainly follow up with you after the meeting. Okay. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Next on my seat, uh, sheet is Jim Jamison, but maybe Jim signed up on the wrong sheet. We already heard from him this evening. So I'm going to cross that through. Paul Streisauer. Is he also the gentleman who presented after? No, Paul. Next on my sheet after these two gentlemen is Mr. Barry. <laughs> Tom, I did see you. Nice to see you again. We have your address for the record. Good evening. Uh, council already knows of our hardships and the encumbrances that we are going through. Could I give my time to Bob Vick so you can hear his expertise as a developer reg regarding the LID? Yeah, we... We typically don't allocate individual time to somebody else. He'll have his own three minutes. Okay. All right. We think you need to hear. Would you from like him. to take your time? Um, I was listening to what Bruce had to say, and I think he covered everything that that we we had need to deal with. As far as the connector is concerned, you know, you know, you know what our situation is. Uh, I was a contact person in the 1970s with Snohomish County regarding this project when the county was planning it. This, that's how long it's been. And now we're, we're pretty much, pretty much uh, not allowed to sell our property because this connector is integral in stopping that. So it's, it's a personal thing. And you, you know what our situation is. We need the resources to sell this land. We're trying to, to save our son. So I don't think I have to say too much more. That's probably enough. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. I appreciate you coming this evening. That ends uh, my sign-up sign up sheet, but certainly imagine there's more people here. Ms. Agard, you're first to raise your hand. If you come forward, we already have your address, I'm sure, somewhere in the archives, if you would like to come forward. We're all here. I'm just, yeah, so I'm checking. <laughs> Attendance. You can call our names out if you so desire. <laughs> here are copies of my presentation for you.
this, <coughs> this Fitzgerald sub-area plan has been the subject of two growth management hearing board decisions. Both decisions affirm the significance of this Nikwachapa or the North Creek protection area. In addition, there were a number of other scientific studies that have been done, the July 9, 2004 Litowitz test, the October 2006 study by parametrics, and the October the 4th, 2004 study by Stewart and Associates. <clears throat> Among other things, he's confirmed that there are about 33 acres of wetlands in the area. They are of high quality. At the time, the categories were considered one and two. There are three streams, Cold Creek, Palm Creek, and North Creek, and two unnamed streams. This is a large and unique uh, wetland stream complex. And in addition, there are mature riparian forests adjacent to these streams and number of wetlands. And these, are, these forests also rate as category one. And they are relatively rare in an urban area such as this. In the 2004 decision, the Fitzgerald low density zoning was confirmed by the Growth Planning Hearing Board as being appropriate for one dwelling unit per acre. <clears throat> and the current LID Fitzgerald regulations that include limitations that you are looking at now and currently are on record are addressed by the parametrics report which confirmed that you needed to have um, a, to limit the, water, limit the watershed development ap impacts about a 65% uh, percentage of forest cover. And they also pointed out that there needed the most effective manner to protect the groundwater recharge, particularly this valuable groundwater that's very high in the coal and Palm Creek areas, the very areas that are currently designated as 5,400 is that they need to limit any kind of uh, disturbance of the soil, particularly to those where there's a high groundwater table in the dry summer time. <clears throat> the current regulations have been estimated in the Coal Creek area as about 47% forest cover by the city staff. But the current proposals suggest reducing this to 40%, and I am opposed to that. The proposed regulations eliminate the prohibition of excavation into the groundwater. I'm also opposed to that. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Okay, I will summarize then. Yeah, and sure, ask, 10 seconds. Pardon me? Yeah, if you could summarize, that would be great. Thank you. I would ask that all of these studies that I mentioned be submitted to the record as part of the hearing record as well as the Growth Planning Hearing Board decisions. Thank, thank you. you so much. Um, thank you for also including your address, which I know we have, but appreciate it. Next on the list, uh, gentleman in front, Mr. Vic. And then gentleman in the yellow shirt. Next. Perfect. My name is Bob Vic. I'm with Phoenix Development. Um, our address is 16108 Ashway, Linwood, 98087. Um, I'd like to uh, first thank the council for considering these modifications to your zoning code. I, I, uh, I think it's a, uh, a bold step in the right direction for these citizens in that area, in that zone. Um, I think it's uh, uh, a, a right thing to do to do away with the Bothell connector. Um, it's a, it's a, uh, a burden that's been imposed for as long as these owners have lived on this property since the, I think we heard the 80s or 90s or something. Um, I think that that, that, that step uh, uh, is a just step and will open up that hill to development. That's a, that's a major catalyst to, to making this get done. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank the, the Bothell staff for the work they've been doing on the code. Um, I know Bruce is, uh, just been pouring over this. We've had exchanges uh, back and forth. 
there are some specifics that um, I think that we should address in the code. And I, and I, and I think that the, I expressed this concern the last time that I spoke here. Um, uh, I think that the, 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 the idea of taking the 40% forested, forested tree cover down from 50 is a good move. I would want to see it go down further because it makes it easier to create the development. But I think there's a threshold there at 40 that would work. The doing away with the 20% maximum impervious language in the code, I think that's really important to making this process work. Um, the challenge that I see in the code is really on the backside of the code. Is when you actually go to build a building in this zone and you're, you're restricted, um, well, first of all, with the forested tree cover, uh, I would suggest that the, that, that the council and staff review modifying this requirement to keep the cluster of 40% in one place or close to it. If you think about that, um, well, the majority of it or a certain percentage of it certainly should be in one place and likely would be because of the wetland corridors and some of the places where the forest is. But if you take and you make that requirement that you put all those trees in one place, you've just created this big critical area on your site which the development then has to work around entirely. Uh, it would seem logical that you would have a, uh, a portion of that forested 40%, the majority of it maybe in one place, but have portions of it elsewhere in the project. So you could actually plan for tree cover in other places and actually get credit for it for your tree cover. Um, staff is, can I just wrap up? If you up want to summarize, that would be great. Summarize. Uh, I, I guess there are a couple other specific issues here that, that uh, uh, with the cuts and fills, um, uh, staff has suggested that 15 feet outside the boundary of the, of the foundation would be enough. Um, that really doesn't get it done for the type of thing that we're talking about. We're on a hillside here, and, and you need more than that area. There's, there's a lot of detail on the backside of this that I think we need to talk about more in review, and I'll be giving comments to, to staff along those lines. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Mr. Vick. Sir, if you would come forward and state your name for the record. My name is uh, Mark Maynard, and do you need my address? Uh, it's not a requirement. If you'd like to, you certainly can. 3527, 214th Place Southeast in Bothell. Thank you. The uh, 39th connector, the uh, Bothell connector, to me is extremely important for traffic. It's been stated earlier that the amount of new development north of Maltby Road, all the development on 39th and on 45th and in between. Um, I actually live in a house that was developed by the Phoenix uh, Development Company. They uh, developed the land. Tonight, driving from 39th to 19th on 228th, traffic was backed up so bad it took two uh, lights before I could get under the freeway on, and turn left at, at 19th. The traffic going uh, east was even worse. What I look at is for um, Fire Chief Horn and Police Chief Cummings, they cannot respond to emergencies as it is now. The 39th Bothell connector would allow traffic to flow. It would have been much easier for me to head south and come across the 195th. It's also a very convenient way to connect to the freeway. And that's moving the traffic. And, and as was mentioned before, the new high school going north on 35th, there's going to be so much more traffic on 35th, or pardon me, on 39th as it comes south, that Bothell Connector really will be a godsend to help mitigate traffic. That's all I have to say. Great. Thank you, sir. Just one correction for our citizens. Comfort. You said that we're not able to respond to emergencies, which I wholeheartedly disagree with. I, I agree. You're responding to emergencies, but it, the traffic was blocked, so it would be difficult to respond. In a, Thank God for lights yeah. and sirens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
All right. So just uh, clarity, we do have an amazing response record here in the city of Bothell, both for our police and fire. So as mayor, I feel it's my responsibility for our citizens to know that their tax dollars are being well spent. And we have a very professional um, captain and police or fire chief that uh, addresses all our health and safety concerns. So further comments from, yes, sir, if you would come forward, state your name for the record. Uh, it's uh, Anthony Powder. Uh, I live at uh, 23726 34th Avenue, Southeast. I'll speak first to the 39th connector. I, I, I think that uh, it's kind of a twofold thing, but I think it's time that a decision is made either way, and, and I really do support either decision because it's, it's moving forward. It's helping people sell their land. It's also helping people get around. Uh, I think with the influx, we need something because obviously we have uh, occupancy rating in the rental area of down south there, business park in that area. Boeing's moved in there. We have a lot more higher occupancy rate. We've seen traffic over the last six months increase. So that's why we're seeing a lot more wait times at our stoplights. Our, our, obviously, the economy's good, so it's a double-edged sword. We make money. Everybody's kind of happier. We deal with traffic more. So, you know, it's, it's a tough play there, but I think it's, it is time to move on to that. Um, moving on to the, the, to the critical area, area changes, you know, I, I'd just be really cautious, you know, obviously 2007 was uh, it was addressed in, in the meeting that was the last time that anybody really did anything. They had one plan there. If you look at 2007 to 2010, 2011, not a lot of development going on anywhere. So I, I think that, you know, obviously there there might be some changes and there might be some middle ground to find. Uh, you know, I worked with a developer on a on a prior thing, compromised a little bit about how, how that was done, and I, I do believe in that compromise. Um, but I do also believe that the homeowners that don't want that change to happen should get a voice and should say, hey, we want to change a little bit of the buffering. Uh, as of now, the last time I went through this with somebody, we had a, uh, a little plot map. I don't know if I can switch the projector over. Where do you just, mm -hmm. oh. So we went through this with my property on, uh, and, and dealt with the developer, and they came out with a map that, that you know, and just thinking about... Uh, um, if you can see, uh, my residence is to the left of, of there. Um, you can see they, they brought up a map that brought a house within five feet of my property line because of the way that they could put it on the land. I think that you really need to protect the homeowners that don't want that change, that like living in that wider space, that, that bought in that area because of that Nick Fuchapa and because of those protections. So you have a large land, two acres, one acre, you know, you can put a house five feet off that property line, depending on what year it was built. You know, you could have built your house five feet from the property line older and you, you, because of the way your lot sat, and then somebody can put a house five feet from you. So it, I just think that there's some reworking that needs to be done in the buffer between the housing as well. And I think it's a side lot. I think side lot is five feet, 10, 10, 10 feet for front lot. I'm not sure it was... I'm learning this as I go, so so don't uh, don't don't quote me on that 100. percent Yeah, it's five, uh, seven feet in Bothell, five feet in Snohomish County. Yeah, so so five feet away, and I just think that's uh, you know if you're 10 feet away, you're 15 feet. But if we can get a 30 foot buffer, it would it would definitely just make that feathered edge as we spoke before uh, just work because we want a diverse community, we want dense housing, but we also want nice w wider open space as well. So. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Mr. Powder. Appreciate you coming this evening. Is there anybody else from the public like to address? Ma'am, if you come forward and state your name for the record. <coughs> I'm Wendy Kalume. Last name spelled K-A-L-U-M-E. I live at 3720, 226th Street, Street Southeast, Bothell. And we, my husband and I, we, we've been living in Bothell for the past four years. And we actually live one street over for, from 228th Street. And for someone who's been living there for four years, we've seen a lot of growth. We've actually, our home was, is in, was, was in the back of a 12-acre property. So we actually watched a, a subdivision being developed, you know, for the last three years, actually. So we've seen a lot of growth. And for someone who commutes every day to go to work, the traffic is horrible. And I really feel that something needs to be done for safety, and just the fact that we're growing for the last four years, I, 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 when we moved here, I had no idea that this was 
uh, an area that would be growing like this. So I, I really think that if, uh, I hope our voices are going to be heard and that this can be taken in consideration that we really need something to be done and hopefully um, the connector will be completed. I'm not in agreement to the, 30, the 35th um, extension plan. I, I don't think that would be um, a long-term solution. Um, there's a church, Evergreen, um, that's there, and I think that would be, I don't think that would be a good idea just to, to expand that era. So that's all I want to say. <laughs> Thank you so much. One of our frustrations, or my personal frustrations as a council, is so many of the homes that were built on 39th Street, Sinclair Woods, and others are in Snohomish County, and the mitigation fees that were gathered, Snohomish County decided to use those improvements elsewhere. So we share some of your frustrations shared this evening. Are there further comments from the public? Sir, if you come forward and state your name for the record. Yes, my name is Mark Wren. I live at 3402 228th Street, Street Southeast. That's on the corner of 35th and 228th, right next to Mrs. Erickson over here. Now, the traffic is really bad, like everybody says. It takes me five to ten minutes to get out of my driveway. Um, but I think the city or the public works department has to prove to me and to a lot of the other public that they can maintain 120th Avenue or Street down in Bothell in the business park before they can build a road in a wet area because they've already got a sinkhole that they fixed next to a fire hydrant that they're chasing south along the curb line. Our and they've also got a lake on the east side of the road that they can't fix. And the, the extension that goes through uh, 39th goes through more wetlands than they can ever dream of. So I would like to see them prove themselves first. Oh, and not only that, how about the fiber optic manhole lids on 228th that everybody dodges? Let's raise them up level, because I know that could be done, because the sewer district has already done it to one of their lids. So let's prove that we can do it correctly before we decide to do further development that's needed. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else wish to address council this evening? Anybody else? This is your opportunity. All right, seeing none, we'll jump into council questions. Let's just get our paper organized here just for one sec. Here's a couple of Does anybody like to jump into the agenda item? Sure. Council Member Lamb. So I, I appreciate very much the comments that we've heard tonight. Um, I, I did want to echo something that the mayor said that with respect to the 39th connector, I think it's important that we're honest with each other about that. There's been a huge amount of development. It's one of the fastest growing areas in the United States on 39th Avenue. Anybody who's lived here, as Councilor Evans and I both live in this area, we've seen it. We've seen it explode in development. None of that money was saved to spend on the 39th connector. So that ship has sailed. That's not our money. That was in Snohomish County. And Snohomish County did not save any of that money to spend on the 39th connector. So I, I hear the concerns. I supported the 39th connector project uh, when I was first elected to this council over 10 years ago. Snohomish County has done nothing to advance that project. And the money that could have been used to build that project is gone. Um, and that's something to take up with Snohomish County because the development has all occurred above, uh, you know, somebody referenced that they had moved into a development, that's a development in Snohomish County. The Phoenix development on the corner of 228 is not in the city of Bothell. It's in the Snohomish County portion, and it's echoed up and down that corridor. So all of that development, and I've never, I mean, it is an incredibly densely developed area. If you drive up north on 39th after Maltby, right now, allegedly they're making road improvements to, to in for the quarter, it's completely unprotected. There's like an open side of the road that in the middle of the night you could drive off. It is, it is a testimony to how not to plan for an area. The problem with that traffic is that all of that pours into the city of Bothell. All of that traffic comes onto our roads and our streets, 
and we're not compensated for it. We didn't get the money for it. The price tag for the 39th connector is $80 million. That's almost $2,000 for every person in the city of Bothell, including infants and people who don't have $2,000 to, to offer. It's not, it, it isn't going to happen. It's not, I'm just being honest. I don't think there's any way in the world. And we as a council would not consider abandoning the 39th connector if it wasn't something where th there isn't the money for it. Uh, Snohomish County has already spent that money and it's not there. Uh, I think what we have to do is look at what we have left uh, as alternative options, but nobody has said to me, "Not you know, I, I'd like to raise our taxes by two thousand dollars a person in the city of Bothell to pay for the 39th connector." That's putting aside even for the moment the questions of feasibility of wetlands that were raised on 120th going down the road. And and I you know I've, I hear all of the concerns about the traffic. I commute through that area every single day too. I I sit in the same traffic that you do. And if I thought that we, A, could could afford the 39th connector or B, that the 39th connector would solve our problems, I'd be advocating for it. That's my thoughts on the 39th connector. I don't really have any questions other than I guess I would ask staff, has Snohomish, just to confirm that, Snohomish County has set aside how much money for the 39th connector to construct it. So I, I think there's... I would have to check with Snohomish County. There is, what we've done is the size of the project is sets itself up for a regional funding package, which there has been no regional funding package since 2007. I think the Snohomish County has kept this on their books because Bothell wanted it on and was pushing to put this project through. Um, but I think from their side, um, I think it's not as critical for for them as it is for Bothell. Well, and we can reach, you know, uh, we can reach out to the county and see. And I would, I would be interested to know if they have any money to throw, you know, at this project now that they've taken all the money from the development on 39th. With respect to the Fitzgerald zoning, um, I, I, I had a question for Bruce. It caught my eye. It said like 40% of the land in this area is in buffers or critical areas. Is that correct? Approximately, yes, based upon the information we have right now. And then there's an there's another 40% that were that staff is proposing that we would have in forested open space. Oh, uh, one of the provisions within the regulations that's the same as the last part was that you could count critical areas and critical area buffers for your to meet your forest cover requirement. So how much do we think of the forest cover is currently in those critical area buffers? Quite a bit of it. Uh, I, I don't. I didn't actually measure that aspect of it, but in, in looking at it, it's probably about 25 to 30 percent of that area is probably critical area buffer areas. So what I'm the one thing that um, that I'm curious about is it seems like we're asking for a lot of uh, if we're, if we're asking for we're, if you had a lot and there are lots like that where there's no forest there's no forest cover at all. There might be a few trees, but there's no forest cover. Right. Are we asking them under this code to say you have to plant 40% of your land that is currently dry and bare and has no trees on it with forest cover? If they develop, yes. And the development would mean going into like a subdivision or something like that. Okay. See, that, that to me seems, seems wrong and seems, and seems, uh, it seems inappropriate and I think it should change. I, I did want to reference briefly because we had um, – reference was made to – to uh, a growth management, a central growth management hearings board decision in 2008, which was surprising to me because, as I understand it, Bruce, and correct me if I'm wrong, the city's decision was appealed, and then the city's position was upheld in that people who opposed our regulations, not because they thought they were too strict, but because they thought they were too lenient. Appealed that, and the Growth Management Hearings Board said, "You're mistaken. The City of Bothell was not was not erroneous in that decision. Is that correct?" But that's correct. Yes, actually, all the points of, and I don't remember how many there were. There were a certain number of legal points, but they were all uh, ruled in favor of the City of Bothell. That's that's what I thought. That was my that was my memory of it as well. And so it was a little jarring to me when that was raised tonight because that was my recollection as well. I, I don't have any more questions. I have a lot more comments on that, but that's all that I have for now. Great. Thank you. That was uh, five minutes of questions. Is there anybody else? 
this, by the way, this was scheduled for 45 minutes. We're at 45 minutes at this point. So what I think we'll do is uh, divide up the remaining 30 minutes between the balance of the six of us who haven't asked questions. So it'll take us to 8 o'clock. Well, hopefully we'll be able to wrap up this agenda item. So other questions or comments? Questions of staff? Councilmember Evans. Thank you. And I appreciate the comments of all those here tonight. And, and this is an issue I started on the council in 2008, and it was one of the first issues that this council dealt, dealt with was uh, this road connection through there and the fact that um, uh, the existing conditions there, wetlands, whatever the case may be. And so it's been something that we've struggled with and we've had on our plan since I've been on the council since 2008. In fact, uh, Mr. Greeby held up a study of, of the earlier earlier um, planning that went into this uh, back in the early 70s. I have a copy of that same document. When I moved into the area, I got that document and looked at it. So the fact that the Bothell connector is there is a good thing in my mind. I, I think it's an important, it's a, it's a good project. Is it realistic? It hasn't been for 20 or 30 years. I mean, we all agree. I don't think there's anyone in this room who wouldn't agree that we need better traffic, better roads, and that type of thing through our community. Not only the city of Bothell is dealing with it, but every other city, the state, the federal, we're all dealing with communication and transportation issues. Um, so I, I, I'll, I'll come back to that just briefly, but a few questions. What if the critical areas ordinance was was applied to this area, and we did away with the LID regulations. What would that uh, would that be any clearer or uh, better for development, better for the environment, whatever the case may be? Actually, the critical area regulations are applied to this area. Basically, the idea is that that regulation would be applied. These regulations go a little bit beyond the critical area regulations. The I kind of LID regulations. The LID regulations do. They kind of address the upland area, the rest of the land area. Okay, but our critical areas ordinance has been set aside for this specific reason of protecting and uh, our critical areas, and and I guess if that were just applied to this area, that would be similar as to what's done in any other area in the city. It would be the same as what's that done throughout the city. Yes. Yeah, the LID is a specific requirement on this area only. For now, yes. Okay. Um, do you have a map by chance that shows the uh, the coal? And it was made reference to the woods, uh, woods uh, drainage basin or uh, creek. Do you have a map that shows either of those at all? And Palm Creek is that another one? Yeah, the Coal and Woods Creek area is right through here. You can just barely see it on this map. And Palm Creek is actually a little bit further north of that. That actually kind of goes into the Canyon Creek subarea. Okay. So this is the Coal Woods Creek area through okay. here. So <clears throat> the Woods Creek area does extend up north of, or excuse me, east of 39th? Yes, yes. There are a couple that, that it it splits in this approximate location. And, and it, one of the tributes goes to the north and one of the tributaries goes to the east. Okay, and in the staff report, it, it made reference to the fact that there has not been much development in the area since in the last, since 2008, 2009. Exactly. The only thing we've had occur within the LID overlay provision is one four-lot short plat. Okay. But surrounding the LID, there certainly has been development. Numerous development in, within right. unincorporated Snohomish County. Right. And within the city, uh, there's the pinnacle properties that have been developed. There, there's the area up 35th. Uh, it's my understanding that there's potential development pending off of 45th to the um, west south. of 45th. Yes. 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 So, so this area is a focus uh, of development. Maybe it hasn't happened in the past, but it certainly is pending. I know properties just uh, north of me, they've been surveying, and it's my understanding there'll be development in that area too. So it's happening all around this area. Um, the 2014 traffic analysis that was done apparently did not take into consideration the Bothell connector. We Is is that correct, Steve, that when you did that analysis, you, you your analysis was not for 
did not include the Bothell connector. Is that true? I think, yeah, I think the question was, would we be able to make the traffic system work without it? So we did not include it, correct. Okay. Um, and, and in this proposal, the staff proposal, there were several items mentioned as far as uh, uh, improvements at intersections and roadways and those types of things, uh, traffic lights and things. Do we have any kind there? I think there was five or six mentioned in the staff report. Do we have any idea what the cost, a ballpark cost of those is? Yeah, so again, I'm going to qualify this. The, the, sure. the easy part is to quantify the construction needed. The difficult part is we haven't gone out there and surveyed the wetlands for a three-lane alternative, so we don't know our environmental impacts. Um, same thing is um, land costs. There's buying right away is quite expensive, and we would need to widen the road a little bit in some of the areas we would need to do that. So that being said, um, if we worked on the four intersections, we worked on 228th, we worked on 240th, and we widened 35th to three lanes, we think we're somewhere in the middle of about 40 to $50 million. And, and that's <laughs> escalated out again. We, right. we projected out, we know it's not going to be built next year, so we projected out so many years just to match what the Bothell Connector kind of escalation was. And it's interesting, all of those people who spoke tonight and drive through the area, we know if the traffic is there now, we're impacted now. But really, your analysis projected out to 230, 2035 as to when the impact would hit the, the largest impact, I guess, or something. In order to meet your level of service in that target year, or sunset year, um, we would have to get all those improvements done by then, essentially. Some, somewhere in between there, we'd have to come up with a path. In other words, you might want to plan what you want to get done in the near term, what you want to get done in the middle term, and what can wait the longest if you want to stretch out that cost rather than do it all at once. Uh, thank you. Do you have a map that shows the, uh, the right-of-way has been certified, is that correct, the proposed right-of-way for 39th? It has been certified in Snohomish County because that's the procedure they used in Bothell. Our comp plan we felt was sufficient to hold that okay. right-of-way. Do you have a drawing that shows the projected right-of-way through the Fitzgerald area there? Actually, I don't on me right now, no. Okay. Uh, I, I think I've seen that drawing before, and um, it impacts... Uh, several of the properties in the Fitzgerald area there, um, north of existing 39th Street. And, and I think the concern of that is, and again, if we had all the money in the world, I don't know. Mr. Evans? Yes. I'm so sorry. Okay. You were at five minutes. You can have four of my five. Uh, well, that's fine. I, I, I just, I, I understand. Uh, the issue and the need for roads, and I, again, I think every all of us would support that. The question is, forty million to take it around potentially down thirty fifth versus eighty million to go the Bothell connector. Um, if I don't know that everybody in the city is going to pony up two thousand dollars per person to build road and, and all of our other traffic improvements, the need is certainly there. But um, it, and in the meantime, this right of way that's certified through through uh, the neighborhood there has encumbered those properties to the point that it, it, it takes away from their uh, development potential. So one last thought, just something to throw out to the staff. If we were to leave the Bothell connector on the comp plan, but looked at how it affected the existing properties in there, and I don't know whether it would be feasible to do this. In other words, the connector is a good thing but it isn't going to happen for a long time. So if the properties in there could could develop without being encumbered by that future road, whenever that might be, for the next 20 years, there would be a lot of use of that property that could be realized without having that encumbered. So, so one option is to move it to the, 30, to the 35th. Would I, I don't know if there's another option to say, leave it there, but do not encumber the potential development of the future, which you know, I don't know how you do that, but I realize that, that the importance of it and how good it is, but it's just it's just a real impact on the existing properties there. Thank you. Who would like to go next? I'll, I'll go next since somebody's raising their hand frantically. Um, on the, let's see, north, 
west corner, I believe, of 39th and 228th, there's the new development, which I think somebody referenced this evening just south of Sinclair Woods. And it, I think it's 35 lots or so. And Steve Cox actually designed it, and I think he did a brilliant job. Um, there's a the road kind of weaves as a semi S through there, and there's a couple cul de sacs that go on. And ultimately, McNaughton Group came in and developed it, and I think Lennar is building in there right now, and probably Village Life. What was interesting is the developer himself, who got the entitlement, Steve Cox, came up with the idea to put that road through and make pr private cul de sacs off of it. <coughs> Do you think, staff, in the future, Steve, that when we're working with a developer who potentially could come forward in this area, could come up with a creative solution to potentially put in a road that in the future could become uh, um, an expanded right-of-way as development continues to occur. Not that we make it a requirement today, but as we review documents um, and plans, that that's something that could be built in segments as time goes by. Steve, you look confused with my statements. You're talking about the north-south 39th? Yeah. Because it acts like a public right-of-way. I mean, most of our streets are public streets, but it acts as a right-of-way without any houses fronting on it, but then it allows f for smooth transportation through that project, which was really just a, a private land or neighborhood that went in. I think the challenge is probably the cost, because while I think that development, I've, it's probably relatively flat that you were talking about. Yep. This one is benched on a hillside. Yep. So I think the cost of that roadway for a developer is probably fairly high um, because you have walls, you have fill, you have cut, and you've got to try to bench it in there. Yep. Um, I think that's part of the difficulty. Um, if it were an east-west road, it might be a little bit easier because you're basically trying to connect to north-south. Um, the other thing, too, is I think the use for the area. I mean, one of the things we're thinking about is timing of this all. Um, the traffic is getting bad now, how quickly could you actually come up with a solution that works? So if you build half the road, we still haven't solved the traffic problem. Um, that's part of the issue as well. Good. Thank you. Appreciate it. So that's the balance of my time with Councilmember Evans. Any further questions for staff? Councilmember Sandberg? I don't see anybody raising their finger. You want to go, Councilmember Sandberg? Sure. Perfect. Um, Bruce, do you happen to have um, the map, the the zoning map for the area? Is that the best map you have of the area? It's probably the best. Yeah, this one right here is probably my, the best map because it shows the most detail. Okay. And it does show the underlying zoning. It's a little hard to see, but you can see it there. So can you remind me on the history? It seems to me we... <clears throat> because it, if you look at the zoning map, you can see that um, in the comprehensive plan that um, that between Fitzgerald and 405, it's more dense. Between Fitzgerald and North Creek, it reflects the building that occurred, and then it's also 9,600. And then between North Creek and 35th, it's R40,000. And then as you go farther east, into where the 39th connector would be, it's zoned R5400. We changed it. It used to all be 40,000. 40,000, correct. And it seems to me that we were basing that increase of density on the eastern boundary of the sub area on the fact that there would be a connector to support that increase in density. And now we're talking about removing the connector. Am I, am I remembering that incorrectly? Um, I, I, I guess maybe what I'll say is that there were a lot of reasons for assigning the 5400A designation to the east area. One of them was it was on the hillside, and it had fewer of the critical areas that we were worried about protecting, so there was a little more confidence there about assigning a higher density. The other thing is the R5400A designation or planning classification works really well with LID. I mean, it is our most flexible zoning category. It really gives the developer some flexibility to move some lots. They don't have to have a rigid lots area. And it was the one that we identified had the highest rate of success 
for implementing the LID thing. So that also came into the mix as well. Um, there was also some discussion about how there was still some concern about density and adjacency to North Creek. And that came in into the, the discussion as well as, okay, well, it makes more sense to have a little less density toward the west or toward North Creek because there was some concern that maybe that was a higher um, uh, uh, protection in and of itself. So there were a lot of factors that came into play as to when those densities designations were applied to the area. Um, but certainly the location of the connector was one of the factors that the council at the time discussed. Because um, one of the earlier speakers, um, I believe it was Miss Williams, was talking about, and if I understood her correctly, um, it seemed to me she said, I'm on 35th and I'm zoned R40,000 and yet I'm going to be bearing the brunt, the impact of the potential, the potential 5,400 development to the east. So she zoned R40,000. She's not contributing as much to the traffic impacts on 35th if that becomes a proposed corridor. And yet she's bearing the impacts from um, the proposed, you know, the, 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 the increased density to the east um, because they're going to have to get out. They're landlocked and they're going to have to get out. So I guess how do we as a council address that perceived inequity um, for the for those folks that live in that portion of the sub area. And I don't know if Bruce, if you have any. I, I can give you some information. Maybe that'll help in okay. your deliberations. Uh, one is that the development potential of those lands in the 5400, we're not talking hundreds of houses. We're talking 250 ish or something like that at probably the most. Uh, in the 9600, it's probably about 80 ish. So there's not, you know, hundreds and hundreds of uh, development potential out there. So uh, the amount of traffic that there would be there as comparison to the existing roadway traffic is going to be almost, you won't even notice that. Okay, so really the the impact is from regional. It's a very regional roadway system. Reg no. Regional impacts, not necessarily from I, local. I, I don't want to overspeak Steve here. Okay. Okay, thank you. So um, <clears throat> in, in talking about if we remove the 39th connector, um, and you have these list of, of projects, you know, the you know the different, there's four bullets, and I think on page 267 of our agenda packet, I think that is the same list. Um, actually, no, there's quite a few more on page 267. But maybe those four bullets kind of capture it. Um, what, what kind of transportation study have we done or can we do to give options for servicing those landlocked, landlocked portions in the R5400 uh, um, if we take away the 39th connector? Like, because we want to we want to make sure that we have, a, a, it's my understanding, please correct me, um, we want to have um, all of those projects listed somewhere on the TIP or in the CFP so that we can collect traffic impact, traffic mitigation fees and apply that to those projects. So um, I'm just wondering, is there a plan for how that new development will get access to 35th or 228th? Because like when I look on the zoning map, I see there's a stub that heads south of 41st Avenue, there's the, um, you know, there's the existing roadway, which looks like about, I don't know, 236, is that your road? But, I mean, is there a plan that, I mean, we, we're, 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 it's zoned for increased density. Yeah, Do we I, know how they would get out of there? Yeah, and I think Typically, that's left up to the developer, depending on how much they buy and where they're going to develop. If they develop the whole quarter of one side, then they may reach from 35th or 39th existing all the way to 45th and somehow come up with east-west roads to connect to those, to those roadways. If the development is a lot smaller, they just buy a couple lots and they're going to do something, then they would have to connect up to 39th and 236. That's all that's there right now. 
Okay. So what is Councilor Stenberg, if you could just wrap up your time here, okay. seven minutes in. Thanks. Um, what is the process by which we put potential projects on some kind of list so that we know that we get traffic impact fees dedicated to those projects? So we don't have the same thing that happened where Snohomish County just sucked away all the impact fees and put it someplace else. Right. How do we know for this area so that that's, we yeah, That's actually the comprehensive plan update, and it's in the transportation element. And one of the things we're doing with our at the same time as our concurrency program. And we make a list of projects that we're going to put on our concurrency. And again, if that project were to disappear and we deem it required to do certain projects in order to achieve our level of service, those projects would probably appear on that list. Okay. And then they would, they would be... They become the wrapped into our comprehensive okay. plan and wrapped into our concurrency. Okay, so I want to spend the balance of my time talking you about the LIE. You're at eight minutes, actually, okay, of a five-minute well, segment. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I would sh I'm sure someone might loan me a couple of minutes. Uh, I'm, I'm plum out. Um, so um, um, for the Council LIE. Member, just one second. We do have three other people in 12 minutes, so if we're taking time, we need to see that somebody else would want to grant you some time. Mr. Agnew is being Thank generous you, with you. Member Agnew. So uh, you have two more minutes. Um, two? You granted four to, to Bill earlier. So we, I have a simple math calculation. I go off five-minute segments. You started at 740. You took nine minutes so far. Um, so you have one minute left of Tom's time remaining. Because this is great public process. So for the LID portion of this, um, I... Um, I would like to, and it, are these just questions or is this um, also deliberation? This is time to ask staff questions. We'll have a potential motion coming forward okay. at some point. Um, so, um, step, um, could Bruce, can you go over the changes that you made to, uh, I think it's on page 303 regarding grading and disturbing the um, the the soil horizon where there's groundwater i mean uh the way we had it originally it did not allow disturbance of the hydrology yes indeed and that was one of the items that the development community identified very strongly to us was that they were so restrictive you just couldn't do any of uh, the kind of grade work that is necessary, particularly if you're putting in a public right-of-way, which has a certain grade maximum, uh, you can quickly run out of uh, room that, uh, in that case. So what we've done here is we've made some changes here to continue to recommend that we limit the amount down to 8 feet instead of the 3 feet, and then the amount of area beyond a building up to 15 feet. So it looks like when you when we have a list of the things that the developers didn't like, they didn't like the uncertainty in the code, and we've addressed that. They didn't like the fact that surface water facilities couldn't be credited to their lot calculation, and now it can be credited. Um, they didn't like the effective impervious area requirements, and we've removed that. Um, they didn't like the forest land cover requirements, and we've reduced them from 50 to 40 percent. They didn't like the the um, requirements on wildlife corridors, and we've pretty much eliminated those requirements because now when they're, they can cross, they can do uh, corridors if necessary, which most people feel when they're developing property, it's necessary. And they identified the 39th connector was a, um, a barrier to development. So it, it seems like we have addressed every single one of their concerns in this proposal? That sounds like a deliberation question. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Agnew, you already took your time. Sorry. You're lucky, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Ray Rayum. <clears throat> Uh, so I have a few questions. So the so the cost estimate for the improvements to 35th Avenue Northeast is between 40 and 60 million. Is that what? It's about 40 to 50. Again, that's a planning level cost. We haven't do, done much out there to ground truth everything. And does that include the bicycle lane? That would include a bicycle lane. That would. Yes. Okay. Sidewalks, curb and gutter. Yep. Okay. 
because that's one of the major bike routes, right, through this area, was going to be 39th and... The way we kind of planned it was we looked at pretty much the same cross-section we would use on 39th. Okay. And it had bike lanes, had sidewalks, and three lanes. So while I, while I have you up there, Steve, so th that table you brought up about the traffic impacts, is that projected for for when? Is it, it, well, I, the number popped out to me that 110% increase in traffic on 35th? That was um, 2035. 2035? Yes. Okay. I think the traffic almost doubles on 35th. Yes by 2035 because it essentially becomes the arterial that's the closest thing to the arterial that you have okay and then i had a quick question for bruce um bruce i just wanted to make sure i got this quote right so you you said the this area of the north creek uh, is the best fish and wildlife habitat in the city of bothell yeah right now it really does seem to continue to have very high quality uh habitat areas and the reason for that is likely because of this area that we've had these additional protections on, or is it just because of what's happening around the entire watershed, or is it? Well, re remember, uh, there was a couple of factors here. One is the fact that there are a lot of wetlands on this in this location that just happened to be there. And the other was that for many years it had a growth reserve designation of R1, so there wasn't any development occurring there. And then when we came in 2006, 2007, we kind of inherited this really, uh, really excellent area. And there's some morphological things that apply to, but I won't go too much into detail on that. Okay. But so the, the influence of this area on North Creek, because there's a lot of area obviously not in this area that drains to North Creek, um, this has had an influence probably on the health of this, the creek inside the city of Bothell. It does have an influence. Um, the amount of that would be almost impossible to measure, but it definitely does have an influence. Okay. Have we done uh, stream temperature analysis at all above this area and downstream in this area? I do know we do have some temperature analysis. I I just can't remember what those are off the top of my head. Okay. And you answered a bunch of my questions before the meeting. Thank you. For, yeah, thank appreciate you for you're sending them to us early. That helps. Um, I believe that's all the questions I had. We're not deliberating, correct, Mayor? That's correct. We're expecting per the ad packet for a potential motion to continue the public hearing to October 21st. Oh, I do. Have, so just to follow up on the response I got. So the sometimes what you do with forested areas is you put them in native, native growth, growth protection easements. And I noticed that was not actually in the code modification. So would the, the protected forested areas be within private properties then? Well, it could be. In fact, there's a, there's a whole host of provisions that would apply there. And we use the term uh, tracks or management easements. Management easement means basically the same thing as a native growth protection easement. You just have some specific provisions you have to apply. So we just have a little different terminology, but it achieves approximately the same purpose. Okay. All right, that's all I have. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Council Member, Deputy Mayor Spivey. You have five minutes. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, I would just want to thank everybody. The, my questions were essentially answered, and um, I, I had the opportunity to talk to staff a little bit and got questions answered. So I just have a comment in that the 39th connector was to be a joint project between Bothell and Snohomish County, and as was pointed out earlier this evening, S Snohomish County has allowed an incredible amount of growth up in that area to the north and has move their traffic mitigation monies elsewhere in the county, saddling Bothell with the, the f essentially the full cost of trying to build that 39th connector, um, a, a very expensive proposition and uh, not one that I would say was um, fair play on their part when we were supposed to be working on this project collaboratively uh, and not doing their due diligence um, towards it that's one of the reasons why I've asked that I asked staff to consider the the all the the current alternative that's up there is it, it's something that we can at least try and move forward and improve the existing um, path that's there to help help the traffic situation uh, we we can work towards making what's there better and improve it 
and, and get incremental um, improvements over time and, and help. But if if we keep 39th up there, there's it's just going to be no no money for, and it's going to be encumbering and taking away from the possibility of making the improvements on the other, on the alternative route. So I, I think it's. Um, if the money was there, I'd say build 39th right now or in, in 10 years from now. But it, it's not, and it's not coming. And so we have to look at the alternative to do the best we can with the cards that uh, we've been dealt. And I think this is the best option at this point. Uh, as far as the uh, Fitzgerald sub-area and the LIDs in uh, that whole LID, I, um, I'm supportive of staff's recommendations. I, I, I think they've worked to find compromise and... Uh, I look forward to um, having deliberations later on. Great, thank you. Councilmember Lamb. So as a process, we have two minutes until our break. I think that we, I would, I'm prepared to move that we continue this meeting until the t October 21st at this time because I think that we're not at a place tonight where we're going to reach a resolution on this. So I would propose that we move, um, continue the public hearing until October 21st, 2014. We have a motion and a second. Any comment on that? Moving it to October 21st, Councilmember Evans. I agree with the motion, but I'm. Is there a direction that we can give the staff tonight as is how to proceed? I think they did make a proposal of some proposed changes, um, and if we agree with most of those, then we can give them that direction. And then if there's others we want them to work further, seems that that would be helpful to the staff. So I'll say in response. I mean, I think what staff has done is respond to questions that are raised during deliberations. I think there were some very discreet questions that were raised during deliberations. I know I had one about how much of the current forest canopy is inside of, or forest cover is, is inside the buffer areas. I know we did, um, and I think I'm hoping t just by map we'll be able to, to get some answers to that question. So um, I, I think what they did with this was say, we'll respond to the questions. Our staff is very creative and thoughtful, and they applied those uh, they they made a proposal based on the questions that they received. I'm hoping that they would do the same tonight uh, in anticipation of the 21st meeting. And so I'll be, I'll be supporting the motion. Yeah, for me, I'm not ready to give direction tonight. I've received um, items in the packet. Thank you, Councilmember Rayum, for asking a few questions. I've not had the opportunity to read through these. I will. Um, and hopefully when we come back on the 21st, by the end of that time, we'll be able to set clear direction and make a vote as a council. Any other further Deliberation. You just had a question of. So, if if we continue this into October, how long will it? If and we give direction at that meeting, how long will it take staff to implement those changes, or will they become effective that night, uh, based on approval? I think you would have to come back to one last council meeting for final um, consideration. I can give a little Bruce? guidance there. Uh, it would have to definitely come back for one more meeting. It might probably be the December meeting. Hmm. So we could do a couple of, uh, we have to go through a couple of processes, SEPA and things of that nature yet. Is it all possible based upon a rejected agenda to bring it back earlier? I thought I saw two meetings from now that we had a pretty free evening. And I don't know, is there more that you feel that you'd have to present to us um, or prepare? Let's see. If, if it's in two weeks, I'm already late with my agenda bill, so I'd have to get special dispensation. But, um, hey, talk to us. Yeah. Um, what do you need? Uh, I can get some. I, I think I could probably return with most of the things I've heard. I'm going to have to go through my notes real carefully and make sure I do that. But um, I could How about do this? it earlier. We'll take a break. I know there's a motion on the floor. You can consider your timing for the next 15 minutes, and we'll take it up right after break. All right. Thank you. We'll be in recess until 8.15. Thank you. Bothell City Council is back in session. We're waiting for two council members to join us on the dais. Waiting for one council member to join us on the dais. I'd like to turn the floor back over to the maker of the underlying motion that we've been that was made prior to our break. Thank you, Mayor. So. Um, Upon reflection, I mean, this is an issue that we've been wrestling with for some time, and I, I talked to staff during the break, and it, it seems like there's sort of been inadequate 
direction for them to bring us back in a form that we'd be able to act on at our next meeting. And so what I'd like to do is is turn the floor back over to Mayor Freed and afford him an opportunity to sort of go through what uh, you know what what the consensus is. It's such that he has heard it, and then we can uh, have an opportunity to comment and move forward from there. So I'll turn the floor back over to you, Mr. Mayor. So just to clarify, you've removed your motion from the floor. I have pulled my motion from the floor, and it was seconded by Councilmember Agnew. Yes. Okay. Councilmember Evans is back with us. So Bruce, what I'd like to do is see if we can come to a consensus as a council and move forward on the three major items that are really before us for decision making. You think the first we should probably jump into is the connector, connector, connector. please. Okay. So, you know, we won't take formal vote. Uh, I'll look to council members to make comment whether they'd like to keep the connector as is, make alterations, or remove it entirely. Is there anybody who'd like to make comment? I'll, I'll go first. I would just reiterate the comments I made earlier. I, I don't think the connector with as presently configured is a viable project and I don't see a prospect of it becoming a viable project unless uh, Snohomish County were to step up with you know 70 million dollars which isn't going to happen because I think they spent that money already so I, I support a removing the connector great Councilmember Agnew I also support removing the connector and I certainly support removing the connector as well so that's Three, Mayor. Yeah, Councilmember Evans. And and I support removing the connector also, but I also support looking at alternatives yeah. to the traffic in there, which if staff describes some some potential uh, changes there and things. There may be other things that come up, but the forty nine, uh, the third, the Bothell connector just financially isn't feasible at this point. Okay, Councilmember um, Ram first, and then we'll go to Sandberg. I support the removal of the connector. I do want to um, have some information brought to us about the caveats that were provided uh, about removing it and what steps and a schedule of uh, actions that we plan to take in response to removing the connector from the CFP. Okay. It's just the slide I'm referring to is the one that was up on the presentation with the caveats. Thing. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Councilmember Sember? Well, I. This is the, the first time that we've gotten a lot of public input on the connector, um, and so I think that's really great. I think it's testament to the to sending out that postcard and, and asking people to give their input. Um, and I was not aware that the alternative, which is um, substandard to the to the connector, um, is potentially a fifty million dollar project. So fifty million versus 80 million. Um, and so it sounds like um, Councilmember Rayum has asked for an analysis of what the alternative is. I, I, and I asked at the break, wh what, um, you know, what kind of funding could it, um, what kind of grant funding could the connector qualify for? And what could we do to improve its competition in, in grant funding? Because we've been very successful in getting grants for other projects and what uh, other transportation projects and what we heard loud and clear tonight was how bad traffic is in the area and how needed a, a transportation solution is needed not just north south but east west so i would like staff to add in a little bit of information about um, the possibility of getting grants and what um, what we could do to make it more competitive if it meant, you know, if it's not competitive because it's a minor arterial, what, what, what would it mean to change it to a major arterial? And would that make it more um, successful for grant money? Great. Thank you, Councilmember Sandberg. Any further comment? Council, our Deputy Mayor Spivey. Yeah, I support the removal of, of uh, the connector. So there's some clear direction for you, Bruce. Thank you very much. Perfect. And City Attorney, is this the proper process to continue to move forward? Absolutely. You're just providing some direction to staff to bring back something that you will act on in the future. So it's not a done deal until it comes back and you like it and adopt it. Perfect. Thank you. Next item of importance, as I understand you want more clarity on, is the impervious 
Or forest cover, rather. Forest cover would be helpful. Yeah. We, we got some testimony from the developer tonight saying 40% seems to be work, but he needs some tweaks to that, I guess. You know, you, I think you mentioned something about some more flexibility there, but um, I'd like the opportunity to explore some of those options, uh, if I may, with your permission, of course. Absolutely, please. Thank you. So anybody who would like to make comment, Council Member Sandberg? I would like to see, I would not like to see the forest cover drop below um, 40%. Okay. So if it's flexibility going up and increasing forest cover, then um, I'm interested in that. But forest cover is, I think, in your agenda, uh, in your staff report, is one of the most significant determinants for maintaining uh, quality and uh, habitat and uh, water quality in that area, and I feel that's very important. Okay. Just to clarify your statement, you don't want to go below 40 percent, but are you okay with 40 percent? Um, no, I. Okay. but I don't want to go below 40. Okay. Council Member Agnew. I agree with Council Member Sandberg that I would not like to see it go below 40 percent at all. For clarity, are the recommendation or more of what we saw here is 40 percent? 40 percent. Okay. You're, okay. 40 percent. Council Member Rayum? Just, just to clarify, well, I'll, I'll give my opinion too. It's 40 percent for R5400. 50 percent for 9,600 and 50 percent for our 40,000. Okay. So it's not just 4,000. Just to, um, and so just to give you a mixed bag of direction, I think we should not roll back the forest retention requirements that are currently established in code, and, aka not accepting even these reductions in the forest cover. Now I say that in exchange for all the other um, um, reductions and requirements that we've uh, have proposed in the code amendment as well as the uh, 39th connector being removed. Okay. Councilmember Lamb. So I would I support specifically to Bruce's question, which is can he look at more flexibility on that? I, I would like that. Yeah, I think I, I would support you going back and, and working to see um, what flexibility you can have in this. I think what we've done with the 39th connector being removed you know, if we like forest cover, a 39th connector would have blown a huge hole in an enormous amount of forest cover and had an extraordinary environmental impact, almost one that was so extreme it could not have been mitigated. So I think by removing that, uh, we have done a, an enormous favor to the environment, and I think it's appropriate that you look at, at additional flexibility on what's left. So I support, um, I support Bruce doing that. Uh, moving forward, and I look forward to this council being able to take action in October. Great, thank you, Councilmember Evans. Yes, I I think we're headed in the right direction, the forty percent. But I do, if there's tweaks to that, <clears throat> I would also like you to look at what if it even went down less, and discuss that with the developers, and how if it's less than forty percent, let's say down as low as thirty percent. How does that impact? Is there any benefit to that in saving of protection of the area and that type of thing? We, uh, the county, it's my understanding the county is 25 to 30 percent on those areas, and uh, in the rest of the city, it's something like 10 percent elsewhere in the city. So, and, and I guess I'm talking mainly the area north of 30, or excuse me, uh, east of 39th, that. 30, uh, the, the North Creek west of 35th is probably, I don't know, 500 feet to the creek. So, and then if you go back up to, to 39th, we're probably 1,000, 1,500, quarter of a mile from the creek. So what can be done to, to uh, make it easier for development but yet still protect our the environment uh, at the distance we're at and overall throughout the whole the whole project so and I and I'm only talking about from 39th east going to what is the potential of, of in, in dropping it even lower before the 40 below the 40 percent the rest of the areas would stay as proposed by staff and that would be just a Clarification, if I may, that would be the R fifty four hundred A designated lands. Correct, because there are some that are actually west of 39th Avenue. 
Yes, there is okay, a okay. little. That's right. There okay, is a little fine. bit I, longer. I, I, okay. Thank you. That was what okay. I was looking for. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Spivey, do you care to make a comment? Sure. I am. Um, I, I am actually uh, in support of, of the what staff had in uh, today tonight's agenda bill. So I'm supportive of that. If there's, um, <clears throat> if it if it means just talking about the flexibility of maintaining that 40 percent and how you go about it, that I'm okay. I'm comfortable with that. But I would still like to maintain the 40 percent. So Bruce, do you feel you have clear direction based upon conversation? Yeah, that, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Good. Any other further comments? Or the last item that we have outstanding is the site and building design items that Mr. Vic had just it just kind of introduced a little bit. And and part of the issue is that they're very technical in nature. They're really geared about, okay, how far you can go down and stuff like that. Um, and I don't have any real proposals for you tonight other than what we had in the staff report. If I may, with your permission, let me do some more look on that one to mm -hmm. see if there's something that seems to be working better for, well, for the property owners and the developers, but also continues to kind of maintain our purpose out here. If I may do that, I'd, I'd appreciate the ability to do that. I'd support Bruce doing that. I would as well. There you go. Okay, thank you very much. That helps me a lot. Great, thank you. Back. So. With that, I would move to continue this public hearing until October uh, 21st. So we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Uh, Councilmember Evans. So it comes back in October. You come back to us with a proposal that, subject to public hearing and uh, comments, that type of thing, that we could potentially uh, act at that time on making these changes. That's right, with findings and conclusions that we could actually in right. implement okay. at that point with yeah. a vote of council. That is the objective, to bring it yeah. back so you can Great. act. Thank you very much. Good, thanks. Hopefully you're not going on vacation in the next week and a half. Or if you are, you're good at what you do. If everybody could place their vote and the clerk can display. Great, thank you all. Passes unanimously with everyone present. Let me get my agenda in order here because we've shifted slightly. Looks like we're back to AB 14138 to consider granting a facility. No, 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 sorry. AB 14139, consider approval of professional services agreement with Pertit for final design services for multi-way boulevard phase two. Mr. Roberts, thank you. Nice to see you. Tonight, oh, thank you. <laughs> the design of the multiway boulevard project was started back in 2008 and continued till it was 60% complete in August of 2009. Uh, since then, it has gone through some phases of work in a corner to accommodate downtown development. Phase one was completed in design of uh, design and construction of the west side access lanes of the multiway boulevard from 183rd to 188th. 108th Street. Phase two proposes to complete the remainder of the multiway boulevard design in its entirety, which includes the west side access lanes from 522 and 183rd Street and the east side access lanes and Bothell Way Northeast from 522 to 188th Street. As of yet, Council has not authorized any appropriation for the ensuing biennium 2015-2016 budget. However, staff is recommending to move forward with phase two to ensure a favorable position to receive grant funding next year and be ready for construction in advance of any proposed development that could avoid costly conflicts and adjustments that may arise if work is being performed concurrently. To accomplish this task, the staff would like to uh, go back to the 2009 60% design and update the design features to current standards and as-built conditions. And then this updated design will then be used to complete uh, final design by summer 2015. City staff recommends the approval of professional services agreement with Pertit Incorporated for the multi-way boulevard project phase two final design services in the amounts of $503,051. Great, thank you so much. So are there any questions from Council this evening? Councilmember Samber. I submitted a few uh, questions in advance. Do you, yes. 
Do you have yeah. answers for those? Yes, and in, in, in regards to the uh, the drainage, uh, the questions in refer reference to that, uh, the hydraulic analysis, there was some verbiage in there that was left over from a previous contract. Uh, we, re we realized we were going to have to update the hydraulic report, and there was a paragraph in there that spoke about, um, well, let me just read it, I guess. It was a reference to detention basins and an uncompleted storm drain project. Well, that storm drain project was finished a couple of years ago, and it, the outfall has is in existence today. Uh, and as far as any detention basin, there's no need for that, no temporary detention basin in this design. Okay, and then so is the is the drainage design to, completed to the sixty percent level, or is it is is it completed to the hundred percent level? It is completed to the sixty percent level. So why is why is the the rest of the design completed to a hundred percent level, but drainage is completed to a sixty percent level? It, it isn't completed. The only thing that's been completed or, so far was a was a storm drain connection project. Uh, that may have dealt with. Um, I don't know if that dealt out the deferred question to Stephen. I guess maybe I'm not phrasing it right. This this yeah. contract is for final it's, design, 100% yeah. design. Correct. And then, but I, what I read in there was that the drainage design would only be completed to the 60% level. But that's that's old language. Uh, the hydraulic analysis is it, we're essentially updating the the hydraulic analysis, and they're taking. Oh, I see where she's using prepared drainage calculations for 60% design level documents. Prepare for 60 design level documents. The, the contract itself will update the memorandum and the hydraulic analysis we have to date, okay. which will give what we need uh, for the 100% design, 100 design package. And so then there's so. not a need for any more design after this design. Right, because everything will be to 100% design. Correct. Okay, and then um, we had the same conversation last week or the week before about um, proceeding with design funds in advance of the bond measure. So if we if we don't if the bond doesn't pass, um, we could potentially be designing a roadway that we don't have funds to complete in the near term, and so. Um, at what point do these designs expire or have the, um, the cost projections have to be refreshed? Well, the design itself does not have an expiration date. It will stay intact. Uh, recently, uh, WASDOT, we certainly do our design standards up to, to WASDOT standards, and they recently came out with a 2014 standard update. So that's one of the things we'll be updating to. But it just came out. So they only do that every two years. So we really have kind of a, a I guess, a two-year cushion before we would have, a, have to make any major modifications, even if it did get pushed out a little bit. And, and what about the cost estimates? The cost estimates, well, just like every year, there may be a, some sort of an escalation. Uh, you're going you're gonna to have that or, or even get lower. But it, for the most part, uh, we do try to escalate our cost estimates based on when the construction year happens. Okay. Um, and then it says, I, I don't know if you, I think you addressed this, but um, it, it, are the, the funds for this contract already available in the 2014 budget? Or it, are these anticipated funds from 2015? Because it didn't look like the CFP sheet showed money, enough money in 2014 to cover this project, this yeah. design. S Steve has a little bit more insight on that particular issue. So there are no funds in the adopted CFP for this or the adopted budget. What we propose to do, though, is your current CFP that's before you and proposed with you, um, we've planned it such that it would allow us to spend this amount of money this year for this project to get the jump on the multiway because we feel it's important. So if you approve this contract, there's funds to cover it, the plan to move forward, the, the CFP you have accounts for it, and then we do a biennium um, budget amendment for this year if we have to. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Evans. Yes, a couple questions. If 
subject to whatever the funding is in the future, um, could this, and we're going to develop plans for the full distance there, could we develop this project in segments? With what, what would be involved in revising the plans if we could only develop for any, and, and 500 feet at a time or something? Uh, is that a potential to do that with these plans, or would you have to go back and? I, my impression is it costs more money to do that because you're, each time you're going to be doing, going out to bid on that particular section, and you're going to have those costs. But, but depending on what the funding source is, we may have to do that. Um, so I guess is that a potential to develop this in segments? There is potential to do that. Uh, you could complete the the west side access lanes and then leave the east side for a, a, a another time. Uh, I think at this time staff is probably recommending that um, we're looking to, to complete design at this w in one shot. Uh, it, it would certainly save a lot of money if we could do that because, like you mentioned, when you do start chopping things up, it does yeah. – the price tag does get – Well, and I, and I support completing the design. My concern is, is what would be the additional costs in the future if we had to segment that development. We couldn't do the full development. You know, there would be potentially some revision of the plans, but – but it w I wouldn't think that much. You'd, yeah. But but you still would have to bid it each time that you go back out and do a section or something, and yeah. it's going to be more cost that way. By doing this design to 100 percent, does that give us any advantage in the grant funding uh, arena? I, I believe it does. If we right now we're we're setting it up to where we would get early in the game, make sure we finish it on time to position ourselves so we can get some uh, TIB funding. I believe for next summer. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Seeing none, we do have a recommended action. If somebody would like to make a motion. I'd move to approve the recommended action. So we have a motion by Councilmember Lamb, second by Councilmember Agnew. Any discussion on the underlying motion? Councilmember Samber. I'll be voting no for the same reason that I voted no for the design monies for Park Both Landing. I don't, not that I don't feel this is an important project. I just feel like if we, we could wait until the outcome of the election, to um, better inform um, the decision to go ahead with the design. And so, like the other um, motion, I I would uh, like to defer this decision until after that election. Great. Thank you, Councilmember Sandberg. Councilmember Evans. I will be voting in favor of this motion. Uh, to me, it's different than the park at Bothell Landing. Um, this is a very key project. There's uh, developments proposed abutting this right away. If you look at the scope of work, uh, there's so many elements here, alignment of right away plan, survey work, construction sequencing plan, roadway section plan, uh, cost estimate update, all of these things, I think we need those in place now because the development potentially is coming along that corridor. So whereas Bothell, I felt like we did have a, a little bit of leeway to wait until we see what the funding is in the future. But this uh, this project affects so many, so many projects along there that I think we need the plans in place as those projects develop that, that even if we're not able to do the roadway right away, at least they know what the frontage is and that type of thing. So I will be supporting this uh, motion for that reason. Great. Thank you, Councilmember Evans. Anyone next? Councilmember Rayum. So um, the, only other, the only other decision that I've been involved with, I believe, with the Multiway Boulevard was to execute the contract to do the, the west side of the, the road. And... Um, you know, 60% plans seem to me to be adequate enough to provide the information we would need to help uh, development redevelop on each side of the in each side of the roadway. And when I look at the budget sheet, that there isn't um, well, there's 861,000 for construction secured. Uh, you know, I I just can't I just can't justify approving this now. Obviously, if the levy passed, we could go immediately to approve it. But I. Um, as it stands right now with the funding, uh, I, I'm not comfortable moving forward. And I think 60% design is enough to give people the information they need to develop on each side of the road. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Ram, Councilmember Lamb. So I'll be supporting this. Um, you know, one of the things that we learned during the capital facilities pr uh, process um, is how much of our projects in the city of Buffalo are funded by grants. Most 
of our capital facilities projects are paid for um, by grants that we get outside of the city. What we heard from from staff tonight is that by approving this design, we'll make ourselves more competitive uh, for those grants process earlier in the process um, and give us access to that money. We wouldn't have been able to do our downtown projects that we have without having access to that money. So I support this project moving forward at this time because I think it'll make us uh, better eligible to compete for grants um, regardless of what the bond, uh, the outcome of the bond election. And uh, I was, I'm proud to support the bond election. I'm proud that we as a council, a majority of the council voted to put it on there because it includes a lot of critical uh, infrastructure projects, including this one tonight. Thank you, Council Member Lamb. No comments? Any comments? No comments. Seeing no further comments, if everybody would like to place their vote to authorize the city manager to execute the professional service agreement with Pertite as presented this evening. If everybody would place their vote, and the clerk in display. Uh, passes five to two with Council Members Sandberg and Rayum against, and the balance four. Thank you, everybody. Next item on our agenda. Thank you so much um, for the presentation as well. Next item on the agenda tonight is AB 14140 to consider partial term appointment to position number five on the Planning Commission expiring March 31st, 2015. Um, understand there were uh, interviews last week. And I am actually, Councilmember Evans, you have a comment? Yes, Mayor. I, I wasn't aware that we actually had an opening on the Planning Commission until last week when it came to us. And uh, this is this is uh, an important commission, probably one of our most important commissions in the city. And I I don't know how we advertised. I It's unfortunate we didn't get more applications. Um, I think we have two applications, and, and uh, but, but I just feel like I, I think there's other people out there that would be interested in serving, and I'm just wondering if we if we could extend this for advertise again for a, a few weeks to see if we could get more applications. We've got two applications, and if that's what it turns out to be, so be it. But but my concern is is I don't I don't know how many people were aware of this, and uh, I'd like to to give people more opportunity to uh, to to at least submit their their information and then go from there. I, I would suggest we delay this decision for until we've had an opportunity to advertise it and uh, see if there are more people that are interested. If not, we'll go with the ones we have. Okay. Any further, Council Member Sandberg? I have a question of Council. Does that violate um, a protocol or a procedure? Um, we, we did... I've seen this. This was advertised in city manager reports. This was advertised on the website. Um, it was out there, and um, people knew about it. And people, and we had, we have two qualified applicants. And I think, um, I don't know. It just sends it sends an odd message to say, "Oh, we got two, but uh, really, what we want is more." Um, I feel really uncomfortable. Um, Op reopening the, the 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 application when it was duly noticed, and um, I don't know. I does, does this violate any kind of protocol or rule? Or so I don't feel that it does. But city attorney, do you feel that it does? I, I recall in our nine, my nine year history that we've actually done that before. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> we have a process. We followed that process. The process is not exclusive. Council controls its uh, own policy and protocol. If council decides they want to um, extend that process, council has the authority to do that. And added to that, um, we have even recently used, um, done the, just the, what um, Council Member Evans is, is proposing. So we have a history of um, re-advertising and going back out for additional candidates. But have we we have re-advertised when we haven't had sufficient applications for the positions? When we haven't had actual applications for the positions, we have applications for this position. So what is the what is the history of having qualified applicants for a position? Have I don't know that. Attorney Beck would know the history of, of what we've done. So, well, he just said that we have a history well, of it, doing that. It sounds like this is deliberation on a motion that hasn't been made. But I'm happy to to allow the deliberate. I'm happy to make the motion. Why don't we let Councilmember Sandberg 
finish your comments and go through the line? In, in my history of being on council, we have only opened up the application, we have opened up the application period when we haven't had enough applicants for the positions. So we have gone with unfilled positions. We've gone with vacancies. And at that point, we have reopened the application process. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Sandberg. Councilmember Rayum or others? Councilmember Lamb? So uh, I'll actually make a motion that we re-advertise this position and direct staff to, to do that if I have a second. second. And I'll speak to my motion. Um, I, I believe that just as we do in the private sector, if you advertise for a job, it happens all the time. They don't, they have applicants that come in and they don't, uh, they, they wish to cast a wider net. It's an extremely common practice. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. And I feel that what Councilmember Evans raised is a good point. I honestly, I wasn't aware that we did have a vacancy um, on it until it was brought to my attention. I had known that we had had somebody leave and I thought that position had been fixed. Um, we're a city of 41,000 people at this point. And if the argument were being advanced that there are, there are simply no more qualified people in our city of 41,000 than the two people who applied, then I would, I, I would think that would be something to listen to. I think there are clearly qualified people, more than the two people who applied. Not, not saying more qualified, but just there are more qualified people than only two uh, who are interested. I agree with Councilor Evans. If we re-advertise and nobody else is interested, then we'll go with the two that we have. But we typically, a planning commission is one of our most important bodies. And uh, my sense is, is that there's probably more interest in the community than was aware of this appointment. The only fear of doing that is a fear of competition, is a fear that more people would express an interest in volunteering for this committee. And I, I don't think that's a, uh, I, I don't have a, I, I don't think that's a reasonable objection to, to opening it up and re-advertising. So I, I will support my motion. Thank you. Councilmember Agnew? I will not be supporting the motion um, for a number of reasons. One, I think we ha do have two qualified applicants that have applied. Uh, this is a uh, partial term vacancy that expires in March of next year. By extending this out, we may fill it by March of next year, but I think we have some candidates and we uh, can fill it prior to that. Uh, I think we probably need to look at the way we go out to the public in the future if uh, we are having a, an issue uh, filling some of these positions, but uh, I will not uh, not support this motion. Great. Thank you. Councilmember Sandberg? I will also not be supporting this motion. Um, we did have two qualified applicants. In fact, one of the applicants was the runner-up for the Planning Commission position in the last time around. Um, we did advertise this. Um, it was in a city manager report, so we would have all received that and seen that. And I stand corrected. There was uh, historically when we advertised for a position, we received applications and then ignored those applications and, and solicited other input. And that was for our salary commission. And so to me, this, it's not about competition uh, or not wanting competition. It's about wanting a fair process. And it sounds like to me, you don't like those two candidates, and so you're going to dig up a few more. And so you can handpick just like you did for the salary commission. I, I'm going to take a, a Mr. Bear, I think those comments were out of order. I don't know who she's referring to with you, yeah. but I think those comments are out of order, and I think they're in violation of our protocol manual. Thank you. And I think that the chair, I think Council Member Sandberg should suspend from making comments that attack other council members. Point of order. Uh, the, the mayor is actually the one that's supposed to provide input on whether or not the which, protocol is being followed. Which is why, which is why the motion was made to the mayor, Council Member Rayum. Great. Thank you. I, we do have an open process here, and we had interviews. And I'll, I'll let you know, I didn't actually not know that there was a planning commission opening that we were going to be interviewing last week in 
even two weeks in advance of that meeting. I actually met with a planning commission member today who was not aware that last week interviews would be happening. So even though there's public notification that goes out, even people who are highly involved in the process, such as ourselves and the planning commission themselves, were not even aware of the process that was going on. So, and I do think it's best to keep things civil, as I tried to state at the beginning of our meeting. So, Councilmember Rayum, I don't believe you had an opportunity to speak. I haven't. So, uh, I'm not going to support the motion. Um, like Councilmember Agnew just said, this is a, a very short term. It's a position that two people applied for. It, it expires on March 31st, 2015. Um, you know, those people fill out an application. They came in for an interview. They followed the process. Um, there's no reason why not to appoint one of them. I guess I just don't understand why we wouldn't appoint one of them for a, such a short term anyways that, you know, just to show some gratitude for them following uh, the procedure and, and uh, applying for the position. So that's it. Great. Thank you, Councilmember Rayam. Further comments on the uh, left side of the dais here, Deputy Mayor or Councilmember Evans? Um, this is tough because I can see both perspectives of this where we could, you know, just keep the vacancy and fill it in the 15th or go ahead and fill it. Um, I will not be supporting it. Uh, I, I concur with uh, Councilmember Agnew. Uh, and uh, at being somebody that's been in a position where you've applied and uh, for, uh, for something and not gotten it, but uh, having the opportunity to uh, come back again, um, it's it's appreciative, and I, I understand how it, you put yourself out to do that, and so I will not be supporting it. I think that's everybody. Councilmember Evans is not making a comment. <laughs> I'm sorry. I I thought I did make my comment. Uh, I think that was in. It wasn't after the motion was made. Okay. I, I we have two applications. If there's other applications that can come in, I'd like to consider those and then pick from from those applications. If the decision is to go with what we've got, that's the way we'll go. Okay. So everybody's had their chance to speak. There was a motion made by Council Member Lamb, second by Council Member Evans, to go back out uh, to still to still keep the uh, two people in consideration, but go go back out and advertise to see if there's anybody else in our community that would be interested. So if you could place your vote, a yes vote would be to go publicize the position again. And if the clerk and display uh, fails three or uh, four to three, so having that process completed, I assume we can go to a vote. And we do have ballots this evening. There are two names on your ballot, so we have a first round. If needed, we'll have a second round, which I don't imagine there would be a second round. It's impossible. There's no. Just uh, for quick clarity. Uh, David Valit, I actually recall voting for just a few months ago. What board is he sitting on? Does anybody? Landmark Preservation. Landmark, so we would have to go back out and advertise for the Landmark Preservation Board potentially in the near future. Okay. So if everybody wants to place a tick mark next to the person that they're voting for, and then we'll have our clerk collect them. Yeah, sure, we can pass them. We'll just, since the count should be extremely easy, we'll wait for 30 seconds. That's hmm? enough time. Yeah. Yeah, would you mind if do you have a... So six votes for Mr. Valit and one vote for Mr. Moritz. I saw Mr. Valit. I don't know if he's still out in the hall or not, but congratulations. He's always shown interest in serving in our city. I actually believe I supported him um, for the prior board that he was on or the current board he is on and um, <coughs> brings a good perspective to the city of Bothell. I appreciate his volunteering for the position. Any further comments from? Mr. Mayor, I'd move to extend the meeting until uh, 920. Second. Any comments? Ready to replace their vote to extend? And I, I'm sorry, I had to. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I yes, yeah, everybody placed their vote. If the clerk can display. 
or passing, uh, moving our meeting to 920. Next item on the agenda is AB 14141. I believe we also have a supplemental number one. Hopefully everybody has that in front of them as well. Ronnie Bennett and our city attorney Joseph Beck are here to present on AB 14141 to consider approval exchange of property with Bothaway Apartments, Widener for the right of way and easements for Horth Creek 98 Avenue Northeast improvements. Ronnie, nice to see you, sir. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of council. Thank you for extending the meeting. I'm here tonight to ask you to authorize the city manager to um, authorize this purchase and sale agreement with Bothaway Apartments for exchange of property uh, for right away we need to construct a Horse Creek project in exchange for some surplus property owned by the city. I'll adjust the map. The red hatching that's flagged with BWA right away, that would be the right away that the city needs to construct the Horse Creek Channel project. Uh, the parcel C1, as you can see, is screened over former uh, 522 right of way. Uh, the parcel D is also uh, former 522 right of way. And then the parcel I is an access easement from access property, excuse me, from parcel C1 over to Ombrick Street. Mr. Mayor, that's a brief presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions or City Attorney Beck as well. Uh, congratulations for one of the briefest presentations we've had in <laughs> recent history. <laughs> uh, are there any questions from Council? I'd move the recommended action. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All right, seeing none, if the clerk can clear the board, we'll be voting on the recommended action to consider approval of property exchange with Bothaway Partners Widener and authorize the city manager to execute the purchase and sale agreement in substantially the same form as presented for Horse Creek 98th Avenue North, Northeast Improvements. If everybody could place their vote. And the clerk can display. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Next item on the agenda I have as AB 14143, a public hearing to consider adoption of a resolution approving the 2015 to 2021 capital facilities plan. For City Manager Bob Stowe, nice to see you, sir. You too, as well, Mayor. I'm thinking of having Ronnie come back and make the presentation for this item. <laughs> <laughs> so for the last um, seven years, the city's prepared the capital facilities plan um, utilizing a committee of council members, park board members, planning commission members, and city staff. And this is a process that's added uh, very much value uh, to the city as this is a document which is a key financial planning tool, as you know, um, to schedule and construct some of the most important and critical capital investments that the city has been making. Um, this process um, and plan received the governor's SMART award back in 2007, and we continue to uh, move forward with that plan um, ever since that time. The Capital Facilities Plan Committee um, was comprised of council member um, uh, Mark Lamb, Council Member Bill Evans, and Council Member Andy Rahum also included Planning Commission Member Mike Stahl, uh, Park and Recreation Board Member Joanne um, Allen, uh, Tammy Shackman, and myself. Uh, the committee reviewed the proposed capital facilities plan in July. We presented the plan to you during a study session um, of last week. The recommended plan includes um, over 55 projects that are secured in funding, um, which total approximately $226 million, which also includes the lift station, um, lift number three, that, that was presented to you during the study session um, last week. Um, that's compared against the 2013-2019 plan of approximately $212 million. Um, and a particular note, um, over 50% of the funding included within the capital facilities plan are from, are from sources outside of the city's funds. Um, I know that there have been a number of questions asked since the agenda packet was published um, last week. Uh, Council Member Sandberg and Council Member Rayum had um, several questions. Um, I believe many, if not all, of those have been addressed by staff. Um, if not, certainly staff is prepared this evening to address other questions that Council might um, have. Um, but at this time, Council is seeking um, your support and authorization to adopt the proposed resolution 
um, approving the 2015-2021 capital facilities plan as presented along with the inclusion of lift station three improvements CFP project S11. Great. Thank you, City Manager. I just want to formally open the public hearing since I failed to do so at the beginning. So, any public comment this evening? Seeing none. Is there a motion? Move to a close the public hearing. So we have a motion by Councilmember Lamb, a second by Deputy Mayor Spivey. Any comments? Seeing none, if everybody can place their vote to close the public hearing. And if clerk can display, passes unanimously. Council, anybody want to take the first stab? I'm looking at Councilmember Sandberg. Sure. Um, so in the questions I submitted, um, I asked for staff to propose some language. Um, so for example, um, if a project refers to another plan, like the sewer comp plan or the 2011 utility phasing study, um, please provide summary language so that the reader doesn't have to dig through another document to get descriptive information. So there were a couple places where we had um, like citywide improvements. So for example, we saw that with um, number SW13. Um, and so in some situations, we describe what those citywide projects are. Um, so capital facility plan number W1 and, and number S1, they have a description of the product projects under status, but um, like SW13 doesn't. And if there are any other project sheets that are like that where they refer to citywide improvements, but there's no description of what those citywide projects entail. Um, I wanted to see that. So I don't believe any of that was um, capable of being completed prior to tonight's meeting, okay. um, beyond maybe the questions that were addressed um, to you verbally um, prior to the meeting. Okay. Responses to your questions prior to the meeting. And then um, I also provided, it's in the email, and I, I was hoping that since staff has the PDF document that they can modify, um, that it um, could have provided that for us so that it's clear to counsel what my amending motion was or would be. But on the email of my questions on the second page, so page 133, is the Main Street Enhancement um, Project, the, the Main Street, Main Street in, um, Enhancement Project Sheet. And I had some suggested language for that. That, So I guess I'll save that for an amending motion. Um, and then um, we received public comment about um, 100th Avenue uh, a few members of the public submitted or, or um, wrote emails to us. So are those being submitted into the public record, those emails from the public? They were sent to the whole council regarding sidewalks on 100th. And if, um, let's see, it was a, I have here a, an email from Ginny Taylor on September 9th that was sent to all of us. Um, talking about if we've got a project sheet to include uh, sidewalk, excuse me, crosswalk or sidewalk on 39th, it seems like we should have a project sheet for the same kind of improvements on 100th. So were those are those emails a part of the public record? They were sent on September 9th. Well, I would say if they were sent to all the city council and you're aware of them, they're part of your consideration for the capital facilities plan whether or not they were rose to the level of, of a priority list from the Capital Facilities Planning Committee, I, I can't address at the moment. Well, I guess I would like to ask that those emails be a part of the public record for this process. I guess what I'm process. saying in short is that they are. They're, they're okay. Um, all, all our emails are subject to public record. Well, I just usually, um, if, we have a, if we have an agenda item, staff will say, and tonight I'm entering in this communication that I received from such and such a place either. Um, yep. Okay. Well, I guess in short, staff would have to receive that information or to present that 
information into the record, but if, if in fact the council received that, again, you're considering that as part of your deliberations with the capital facilities plan. That's right. I, I mean, me personally, I did not forward those emails to Steve. So it could be that Steve wasn't on a CC and it would be difficult for him to make sure he's checking through all our individual emails. Did you potentially send them to him for the record or no? No, but oh, I just okay. assume that they, I don't know if, if your name appeared on the list or not. Um, not the city manager's name, but um, I will forward those to you so that they can become a part of the public record for this. Yeah, and I, I guess I'm not aware of how it becomes part of the public record. Typically when we have a sidewalk or safety issue, we get emails or correspondence to us, and we check on them and we basically prioritize those issues. And if they rise to the level of the project, then we propose them to come into a CFP program. The ones that you're talking about appear to be probably best fitting in one of our operating programs, either the sidewalk program, which you would just probably discuss during the biennium budget discussion, or potentially uh, to talk about as um, some other capital program, perhaps, that would address safety projects and things like that. Okay, so on page 151, we have a project sheet for citywide safety improvements. This sheet says the design work has been completed and construction will start in 2015. And it says that, quote, there is the installation of new crosswalks, channelization, and other right. intersection improvements to take place. So I, would, I was wondering what, where are those installations occurring? Because apparently we've already completed the design work. Right. And, and if we could include that information on the project sheet. We could include that as well if you want, sure. Um, if you want to hear where they're including, we can, yeah. I okay. can provide them. Okay, for T62, which is the citywide safety improvements, we're putting, we're working at Meridian Avenue South and 233rd Street Southeast, new crosswalk channelization and sidewalk grading improvements. Uh, 92nd and 183rd, we're putting crosswalk and sidewalk improvements. Main Street and 102nd Street, we're putting crosswalk improvements. Main Street and 104th, we're putting crosswalk improvements. And at various locations that are too numerous to, you know, we're putting signal backing plates. Those are the colored ones so you can see the signal. Signage and striping at various other locations. For T61, which is the corridor safety improvement project, um, we'll have 228th and 19th intersection. We're going to do channelization, crosswalk, and sidewalk improvements. 228th and 15th, we're going to do sidewalk improvements and signal enhancements. And 228th Street and the, the business access of QSC, we're going to do driveway channelization improvements. So is that Absolutely. information that you want in the capital facility plan sheet? I mean, that's, that's instructive for the reader. Mm -hmm. um, do I need to remember to make an amending motion for that, or is that something that council can just give direction to say, yes, that, that is important information to put on a project sheet? I think that our sheets are so limited with the amount that you can have. You could dig deeper if you so desire. And just a warning on time, it's 9.08, so you've taken seven minutes of our allocated five minutes per speaker. So if you could take 30 seconds to wrap up, that would be great. I'm done. Okay. Councilmember Evans. So a question. Your, your project worksheets are pretty general. Sometimes they're project specific, but for example, this this 228th corridor safety improvements, they weren't listed out there. So now, why wouldn't you list, are they listed someplace else? Um, so, in other words, I guess, first, I'm not convinced the public's gonna review this document in detail to start off with, but, but if somebody was concerned about safety corridor improvements, in their particular neighborhood or site, I'm assuming they'd contact you. There must be a report or something right. somewhere where we have these projects identified. So just to be brief, there's, there are a couple ways we would describe a project, and they would be for two different purposes. As an example, the annual water main replacement program, we would rather not specifically identify mm -hmm. exactly where we're going to do the water main projects because from year to year, different issues come up or the prioritization changes, yeah. and we would not want to have to come back to council just to change 300 linear feet of pipe. So that one would be described very loosely. On a project like this one, the safety one, I think you are correct. We probably could get more detailed because it is has federal grant money and we have to get very specific. 
but I will ac- actually also backpedal a little bit. And as an example, when we talk about safety program, for example, if we wanted to fund that, we'd like it to keep it general so we have the opportunity to prioritize things and come back to council and say this is this year what we plan to do because it rose to the highest priority. See, that that makes sense to me that we've got general categories here and and what you may put in here now, there may be a higher priority come up for that money somewhere down the road. So I, I, I think, you know, where it's a specific project, identify it. Where it's a general category that we're looking for funding for so much for sidewalk improvements or safety improvements, keep it general and then, you know, fill in the details based on where the grants are available and, and what the projects, based on what public comment might come back to you for, for interest. So I don't, I don't see a problem with the way the worksheets are now. Great. Thank you, Councilmember Evans. Click on X. Councilmember Lamb. So just as a process point, we have, we're extended until 920. Um, I'd actually like to move the recommended action at this point. Um, if I, make sure if sure I have the chair's permission to Out of respect that. for other council members who haven't had a chance to ask questions, or is there anybody else who wants to ask questions this evening? Councilman Rayum would like to. I'll yield the floor to Councilman Rayum. So I did submit some questions um, earlier today, and I, I did actually didn't get a response on these ones because uh, I know you were out of town or on vacation. I hope you had a good vacation. Welcome back. Um, but last time we met, and I should make this quick so that I don't go past my 4.25 seconds. Um, can you? I that's. <laughs> and I'm already burned into it. Can you go over a bit about the debt service table that we have? That's on page 52 of the last week's packet. Um, just kind of because I, we heard some te- um, council member Sandberg had some concerns about it, and I just thought it would be helpful for people to understand. Um, what it is, those, those four different, well, there's only two really that are hard to, to just know off the top of your head what, what the debt's, the debt is for. And then the second part would be, how do we plan to pay for that from year to year? Okay, mm-hmm. good luck. You have 3.75 seconds to go. <laughs> okay. Um, basically the, um, the, the first project is the lift. Um, worked with the Department of Revenue, got approval to use um, traffic impact fees rather than real estate excise tax for that debt. Therefore, because obviously uh, the impact fees were for that project and um, those are more restricted. So that leaves our real estate excise tax more open for other needs. Um, Going on to the city hall, we have... um, uh, $500,000 for uh, facilities from the annexation area to pay their portion of the lease. Um, we have in the first year or two, we will have a reimbursement from the um, nonprofit, the 6320 nonprofit. Um, <clears throat> depending on when we take possession of the building, we will also have a sign- significant amount of capitalized interest, which whether they have it or we have it, it still gets used for um, the purpose of making the first couple years lease payments. So we will probably be out till 2017 before we actually see a lease payment that the city has to come up with for the next probably four years, um, 17 through um, 20. Um, we will likely be utilizing um, proceeds from the sale of property. After that, um, we will be looking for a million to a million and a half dollars. It will be closer to a million um, dollars that we will have to, council will have to make a decision about. And I talked about this uh, previously. Um, uh, you could use a portion of operating revenues from, you know, new revenues coming in from the downtown. You could use real estate excise tax. We, tax. We've, u- we've looked at the um, economist reports. We've had three different reports. All of them show a real estate excise tax increasing significantly over from 2016 on. Um, so council will have a decision as to how they want to um, uh, pay for that. Um, the A and B 2013 bond, um, 4.5 million of that is the Multiway Boulevard Phase One. Um, that is again being paid for with traffic impact fees um, because again, those that's one of the projects that is rest- one of the projects that we can still even use within our. Um, uh, municipal code uh, for that perp- for traffic impact fees. 
Um, the other portion of that is very small. It had to do with um, the last two properties for the NSD, um, and those monies are being paid for with real estate excise tax. I believe it's three hundred and twenty-eight thousand um, dollars per year. Um, and then we have. Um, I think I've hit hit all of them, haven't I? I think so. Just so real quick, so back to the lift one. So what did that pay for? Why did we incur the that? The lift, we, it's, it's approximately um, $2 million a year for 25 years. We paid for the crossroads with it. That was the, the award that we um, competed for statewide um, with many other cities. We received the award. Um, it was... Um, um, we received the monies up front, we used the monies towards that project, and then we brought in revenue generation um, at a point of in excess of a million dollars a year. So basically we get the city was awarded a million dollars a year for 25 years. So for a 25-year period of that debt, um, the state will be reimbursing us their portion of sales tax to make that payment. The other half... Um, is being paid for by traffic impact fees associated with um, the uh, downtown, um, the, the crossroads. Thank you very much. I appreciate <laughs> that. Am, am I out of time? I'm, I'm sure I'm out of time. You are. Thank you, ma'am. Perfect. Councilman Bragan. Deputy Mayor Spivey. Okay. Councilmember Lamb. So I would move the recommended action, although we're set to expire at 9.20, so I'd move to extend the meeting until 9.30. 9.30. So we have a motion by Council Member Lamb, even though it sounded like he was making two motions. The chair is determining one. one to extend to 9.30. Um, you have the second? Check. We actually have a second from Council Member Sandberg. All over the and just for clarity, because there's been a few chippy little fun remarks tonight, which is fun in a public process, uh, we're sitting at 917. If I don't set time limits, we go to 11 o'clock. So as uh, the chair of our council, I set certain times to be able to speak. And I've been fared at the beginning of meetings to open up for council members to state how much time they need added. Um, as I look at our U.S. government, you look at Congress, and they're allocated a certain period of time to speak. I don't think there's ever a criticize, anybody criticizing the chair regards from the Congress going to the chair and saying it's inappropriate and a violation of public process. Um, we see these time limitations across our nation and many def different governmental bodies. So the allocation that we're violating some public process is ridiculous. Having said that, let's go to a vote. All in favor of moving to 930? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yes. So we have one opposed, six in favor. So we will go to 930, 12 more minutes. You have a motion? I, I do, Mr. Bear. I would move the, uh, the recommended action, which is the adoption of our 2015-2021 capital facilities plan. And I'll speak to my motion. Second. Council Member Lamb. Um, I, I really want to thank our staff for the work that they've done on this. This is an, uh, a great document. It's a document that is, is coming over a period of time of many years. There was a comment that was made, and it's a planning document that has helped us to do many of the incredible things that we've accomplished as a city. There was a comment made last week that, you know, well, I think this is kind of like a rubber stamp. In reality, I think this capital facilities plan probably has the most profound changes that we have seen um, of any of them in the sense that we have removed the single largest capital item from that by our action earlier tonight of uh, removing the uh, Bothell connector from that plan. We're reaching out to our neighboring jurisdictions on an aquatic center. This is a very, very good plan, and I'm proud to support it. I'm proud because it implements the vision of Bothell citizens that we've worked very, very hard over many years to obtain. Uh, with respect to the timing issue, we we had uh, an enormous amount of discussion in our, our committee. We had a lot of discussion last week at our capital facilities plan. And as the mayor has alluded to, at the Supreme Court of the United States, at the United States Congress, at the committee level of our state legislature, um, everybody has to limit its time. We limit the time of people who come and speak to us so that we can have an orderly meeting. When I first came on council under a different mayor, we often met until 1.30 in the morning because there weren't limits on time and we didn't have limits on discussion. It's been commented that we don't make good decisions after 10 o'clock. 
I think it's important to have limits on time, and it's important that we be respectful of our chair when he uh, f enforces those limits. So I'll be supporting this motion, and I would encourage my colleagues to do the same. Thank you, Councilmember Lamb. Any comments on the underlying motion, Councilmember Moreno? Are you oh, no. are you just playing with your pen? Yeah, okay. Councilmember Sandberg. I'd like to make an amending motion. Yeah, you have the floor. Um, I would like to um, propose that we return to the practice of our previous CFPs where we provide um, a map of projects that precede each section. So a map for the parks, a map for the transportation, and then map for the utility projects like we have done previously. Um, there's no second. Councilor Moreum is seconding the motion. Would you like to speak to your motion? Yes. Um, like I said in the study session last week, I feel like combining all the projects all in one map is confusing to the reader and difficult to read. And when I look at um, the last CFP, um, the the maps are are very clear and user friendly. And um, there's no reason why we can't continue to when I mean, we can have the the downtown blow up project uh, map. But I I like the way we did it previously. Thank you. Any further comments on? Yep, Councilmember Ram. I just wanted to ask a clarifying question. So, are you saying that you would like this to be amended before we approve it, or is this in future? Your many motion was to have maps to added for this document. Okay. Any Councilmember Evans. Uh, I'm looking at a copy of the CFP. And I see two maps in here uh, identifying parks projects, transportation projects, um, not showing on map is some open space acquisition, downtown, you know, there's a few projects that aren't showing on there on one page. And then on the other page is a continuation of park projects. So I, I do recall in our previous CFP, having individual pictures on each project worksheet. No, that's not what and we're talking And that's not about. what you're proposing. I understand that. Mm -mm. What you're proposing is a map at the beginning of each section. And and I'm not, I guess I've, I've got a map here that shows me where these projects are at. So I, I, I think the information is here. I don't know what we're missing. But. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Evans. Any further comment on the amendment? Seeing none, the motion by Councilmember Sandberg, second by Councilmember Rayum, would be to alter the document to make individual maps for each section. A break could place their vote, and a Kirkland is, can display. Fails five to two. You still have the floor, Councilmember Sandberg. I'd like to make a second amending motion to include the um, staff proposed language, additional language for 6320 method financing to be included in the, the CFP. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Would you like to speak to your motion? No. Anybody? Further comments on this item? If everybody would like to place their vote. If the clerk can display. Passes six to one. Councilmember Sandberg. And then on page 133, which is the Main Street Enhancement Project Sheet, I um, provided the revised language. It's in the email that's before you. Um, it's the bottom, starts on the bottom of the second page. You didn't mind just reading it out loud for us? Um, I, it, so to give you an overview, it changes one word, implements to envisions. It adds a sentence, it adds a new sentence, and it moves one sentence to um, a, a different paragraph. And so it would read, the Main Street Enhancement Project envisions improvements to Main Street from Bothell Way to 104th. The first phase of the project comprises improvements on Main Street between Bothell Way to just east of 102nd Avenue Northeast intersection. I would like this sentence added. The second phase, Main Street Enhancement Phase 2, 102nd Avenue Northeast to Kaysner Way can be found in the future capital project section as CFP number T42. And then in the new paragraph, you would start with the sentence from up above 
and it would read the project reworks the entire streetscape from building front to building front and then there's no change from there the project will include a flexible parking zone for parallel parking that could on occasion be used for other purposes such as outdoor cafe seating this project also includes replacement of storm sewer and water utilities in the street cross section there is no second do you have another amendment okay and that would be all okay thank you can I still have the floor to speak to the underlying motion unless there are there yes. any motions Please. okay um, I will not be supporting the underlying motion I appreciate the work that staff has done mm -hmm. Um, so, and, and, and this is not a statement on their hard work in providing this document. I feel as though um, this is the, if not the second most or the most important document for the city, and I feel as though the process um, did not allow for um, um, thorough discussion and, and questions to be answered. Um, I asked questions in the study session and then was cut off. I provided my questions um, by Friday, and you know I understand if there are um, if there are staff constraints and illnesses that that can't be answered, uh, but I'm not prepared to support this tonight because I feel a document of this size that allows one amendment to it does not speak to the fact that um, other council members are allowed um, outside of the capital facility plan committee to um, have an impact on this document. So I will not be supporting it. Okay. Just for clarity, uh, there were three members that served on the capital facilities plan. You had the freedom to make amendments to the entire council. Um, you had the opportunity to make any impact that you collectively gathered support for. Uh, you had the opportunity. To do so so I, we don't restrict process any further comments on the underlying motion as amended council or deputy mayor spivey i'll be supporting it i think that all the council members had a fair and equitable opportunity to um, speak during the um, study session uh, nobody was gaveled down and cut off during that time period uh, it was it was fair equitable and m Final decisions were made by conferring with the rest of the councils to conclude the um, the item, uh, but I will be supporting the doc document as presented. I want to thank staff for all their hard work on it. Great, thank you, Deputy Mayor. I appreciate that. Further comments we've had, heard from Councilmember Lamb, Sandberg, Spivey, Councilmember Agnew. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Perfect. I will be supporting the document. I want to thank staff for all the work they did, and I know in their hearts they'll find the little crosswalk for the Valhalla residents so they don't have to walk on that little path next to this bridge that was built in 1947 and their dog could run out, but I'll be supporting the motion. I have ex seem to have experience with that location. Councilmember Evans or Evans or Ram? And, and if you guys need more than two minutes to speak to it, we should extend immediately. Uh, we would extend the meeting until 9.40. Second. Um, all in favor say yes. yes. Aye. Yes. Uh, um, that was, sorry, that was not clear to me. So if everybody placed their vote and a clerk can display, fail, uh, passes 5 to 2. So we're going to 940. So Councilmember Rayum, I think you had the floor. Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to staff for all the work that was put into this document. Um, I will be supporting the document and supporting the motion. Um, I do think that as we move forward, though, as a city, the, the debt service aspect of the capital facilities plan, I think, uh, needs a lot of attention. Um, you know, I, it's just... It's a big deal, um, especially keeping an eye on how much debt the city has and what they is accrued debt from, um, or what what we bought basically with it, and how we plan plan to uh, pay it back. So, um, just with that, I uh, I'll approve or uh, support the motion. Perfect, Councilmember Evans. Um, I I will be supporting the motion also, but I I do appreciate the discussion that we went through. Uh, 
and I think there were a lot of good questions asked. Uh, this is a planning level document at the 30,000 foot level to some degree. Uh, there were a lot of specific questions asked, um, and there were some recommendations made for changes to the document that I think staff can consider in the future. Um, the reality is I wish more public read these documents, but I, I just, in reality, I don't think they do. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't improve them somehow if we have to do that. But I, I think we, we did have a good process. Uh, it, there, there's a lot of information here. These projects will come back to us as they, as they go out for development or bid or whatever the case may be. So uh, the public's going to stay informed on this through just through our deliberations on these each project as they come back. And uh, yeah, I uh, look forward to approving the document and moving on. Great, thank you. And I'll finish with my comments. It, I, I actually had the opportunity to serve, I think, on the first capital facilities meeting. We met several times uh, in the police community building. I remember Tammy, you were there, and and Bill, and and others. I think it was a very positive process. This document has evolved over nine years, if I'm counting my years correctly. We've had multiple different people and personalities on council here. We've certainly had staff in the city of Bothell evolve and change slightly over that period of time as well. We've all had multiple opportunities over nine years to make comments on this document. It's not a surprise document that was just introduced recently with all new projects on it and completely new. It's It's been something that we as a council and staff have had an opportunity to speak to. Also over 41,000 or 40,000 people in our city have had multiple opportunities over nine years to contribute to this process. As in all things in the city of Bothell, we open public input at every meeting. Um, we like the public input because we are the public ourselves, and so we don't like to limit ourselves typically in the process. So a lot of times there's a little bit of a downer approach to what we do, but I encourage the council members up here to try to look for enjoyment in what we do as we're spending time here away from our families and friends. Uh, so as we approach our next meeting, let's try to do it so in a positive manner and move forward. So I'm excited about this. I have maybe a unique opportunity for the last few months and um, former Mayor Lamb had eight years of excitement going out in the community and hearing from stakeholders and also people in Olympia and actually literally around the state that hear about what we're doing here in the city of Bothell and say congratulations. The majority leadership in the city of Bothell is doing a good job. So thank you all. Uh, if everybody could place their vote and if the clerk can display. Passes six to one. Thank you, everybody, for the rousing discussion. We have seven minutes left. Is there an executive session this evening? Nothing planned, Mayor. Okay. How about city manager reports? Anything you'd like to report to us? Um, nothing. I can't wait till the next meeting, Mayor. <laughs> okay. Anything for the uh, the good of the order? I just have one thing that's actually a positive uh, thing to contribute. I appreciate your remarks. Um, I, I was honored to be appointed by the Chancellor of the University of Washington. Bothell to the Chancellor's Advisory Board for the University of Washington Bothell. And today we had a meeting with, uh, first of all, it was an all faculty retreat, and then it was a meeting of the advisory board uh, for the Chancellor after that. And the plans for that campus of, of over the last five years, how they've changed and how it will change over the next five years, are something that is helping to drive not just economic growth in the city of Bothell, but also. Uh, cultural growth and it's really um, a dynamic force within our community and so I just wanted to uh, thank our staff for the way that they've reached out to to that campus and thank my fellow council members for the way that they have recognized that what is good for the University of Washington Bothell is good for our city and it is um, really really exciting to see the national recognition that that campus has received for the good things that they're doing and the educational opportunities that they're providing uh, to underserved communities and to people who are the first in their generation to go to college. It's a really special place, and it's something that um, we all should be proud of in our city. Mm, absolutely. It's an, I'm glad you brought up the university. I actually was at the university on Cascadia twice this week, one at the college um, and one at the U, U, UW. And the first was for the Biomedical Device Summit, which actually is held here in Bothell, which draws people not just from Washington State but outside of Washington State here in our city of Bothell to our campus and people were bragging about what's going on in the city. Then the next day I met with uh, Leadership East Side, which gathers together 150 of our East Side leaders, including council members, uh, leaders in cities around our community, and business leaders as well. And they're there for a two-year program to learn about leadership. And I was served on a panel with seven other mayors 
Um, almost all of them came up to me and talked about what's going on in the city of Bothell and what they're excited about. So thank you, staff, for your leadership in that and council as well. Yeah. With that, yes, Council Member Lamb, or um, Evans, sorry. I, I think there's been a request uh, for the existing conditions report of the RFA, and I wanted to check or have staff check and make sure that that's been posted to the website. Uh, I, and I think it's a document that the public could see. So if somebody could follow up on that, I would appreciate it. We will do it. that. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else? No, with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>